Good evening, everyone. Well, welcome. Oh, we have feedback. To the feedback. Uh, this is the Shrewsbury Zoning Bureau, Bureau, Board of Appeals, and we are going to have we have a packed agenda this evening. So I appreciate everyone's attendance. I'm going to jump right in and ask um, for some housekeeping items to be taken care of. Um, I'd like a motion to approve the bills for. 9750 and 155 for the community advocate and 14864 for office supplies from WB Mason. I get a motion. I move to pay those bills as stated. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. Thank you. Okay, moving right along. First 630 hearing. This is to hear the appeal of Scrappy Pet Enterprises Inc. 11 Kent Drive, Northborough, Mass, 01532, for a variance to the Shrewsbury Zoning Bylaws Section 6, Table 1, to conduct a dog training services within a portion of a building upon property located at 810 Boston Turnpike in the Limited Industrial District. The subject premise is described on the Shrewsbury Assessor's Tax Plate 35, Lot 025001. Can I ask the appellant to please introduce themselves and explain to the board why you're here tonight? Sure. I'm Suzette Spitzer. So Scrappy Pet Enterprises is my company, and I've purchased a Zoom Room dog training franchise. So the business model is actually to train the owners to train their dogs. Um, it has a maximum of eight dogs per class with their owners um, attached to them for a 50-minute class period. So we've got folks coming in and giving us that little bit of room so that we've got about like five minutes for them to exit, another five minutes for the new um, set of um, dogs and folks coming into the building. And the variance request is for a variance for the use there because it's light industrial. And all of that, I'm going to kind of turn over to Mark to talk through further. But if there's any other questions about the business itself, I can, I can answer those. So the hours of operation would be 11 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. Monday through Friday, and then 9 to 5 on the weekends. And um, that is, so, yeah, so that is Monday through Sunday, so seven days a week. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Mark Donahue from Fletcher Tilton with um, Suzette and Scrappy Pet Enterprises to present this request for, for use variance for a site located, as the, um, the public uh, announcement indicated, within the limited industrial zone where a retail store or service establishment is not a permitted use. This is a site not dissimilar to a couple of other sites along Route 9 that are pockets of limited industrial that over a period of time have developed uh, into a more retail type of use than the industrial type of use that the zoning calls for. This island of uh, limited industrial binds, or is bound by the commercial business zone used for the automobile dealerships just west of the site and then on the opposite site just east by the apartment zoning district by the large apartment complex that is there. Uh, in order to meet the requirements of a use variance, as this board knows, there are certain requirements that must be met. And as set forth in our application, we believe that the application meets those requirements. The property is unique because of its proximity to Route 9, uh, which is much more of a retail or commercial type corridor uh, than the industrial zones uh, in other parts of the town. 
uh, which are more uh, segregated for those particular uses. Uh, and it's also unique because it's bound by those type of activities, commercial business and apartment, where industrial type uses that are the uses permitted as of right in the industrial really would be to some extent inconsistent with the way that those sites have been developed. Uh, an enforcement of the bylaw by not allowing the use would constitute a hardship. The hardship for Suzette is pretty clear. She wouldn't be able to put her business there, and she's been looking for a site to locate in Shrewsbury for an extended period of time that works for the ease of customers uh, to be able to find it and be able to take care of a geographic distance people are willing to travel. The site has developed through other uh, applications to this board and to the planning board into a mixed-use type of development. It has active indoor recreation uh, in the rear of the building. It has other types of retail or uh, businesses that people come and go to on a regular basis, and therefore trying to find a use that would meet the requirements uh, would, would be difficult for the owner. Relief can be granted without substantial detriment to the public good. This board has, in these situations, granted such relief. At this site, and by way of example, at 910 Boston Turnpike down the road, uh, without any detriment to the public good, in that there's no large traffic that travels to or from the site that adds to the burden on Route 9. As Suzette indicated, she has eight patrons uh, on a 50-minute schedule, so it doesn't uh, tax the, either the site in any fashion or otherwise. And it can also be granted without nullifying or substantially derogating from the purpose of the zoning bylaw which while the, the use, variant, use variance is required, the bylaw does permit that in these particular cases and these unique circumstances, and we think those requirements are met here. Uh, and so we would ask this board uh, respectfully uh, to grant the use variance uh, and let us proceed. Uh, there is a side issue that's raised in the memo from staff, but I'll stop there and see if there's any questions or issues, and then I can touch on that also. Thank you. Ms. McAllister, would you like to add anything? Well, I would probably like to, to touch on that and to go into a little bit of staff comment, um, if the board doesn't mind. Um, so as seen on the parking plan for this use, they're showing parking um, um, contributing or, or being calculated using both 820 and 810 Boston Turnpike. Um, so it's the opinion of the zoning um, enforcement officer that a special permit is going to be required through the planning board for a shared parking agreement um, as outlined in our zoning bylaw. Um, sh there are particular concerns around pedestrian safety, about um, movement around the site if the shared parking moves forward without any sort of oversight. So um, at this time, the town doesn't feel that the parking plan adequately references or speaks to the shared parking agreement. Um, and takes issue with, again, this parking plan as it um, is related to the proposed use on the site. If I might, Madam Chair? Certainly. Yeah, so those points, which Ms. McAllister and I have had a chance to, to, to chat through, uh, a few different things. Uh, we have a respectful disagreement uh, with the building inspector on interpretation uh, of the bylaw. Um, your bylaw in the uh, applicable section uh, basically says parking needs to be provided in what we read to be three different scenarios. Parking for a use needs to be provided on the lot of that use. The bylaw then goes on to say, except where two or more businesses may jointly provide the required spaces on one or more of their lots contiguous to each other. Um, and that is in section three. Five, Article 7. It then goes on as a third option to obtain a special permit from the planning board if parking is, is going to be located remotely but within 200 feet of the site. And so we read that as three different ways in which one can meet the parking. And here, the parking would be met in that 810 Boston Turnpike is owned essentially in common with 820 Boston Turnpike. And as demonstrated by the parking plan submitted, the aggregate of those sites provides 133 spaces where for the existing uses plus the proposed use, there are 114 required spaces. We, we also, with regard to the uh, beyond the technical part of that, and I can come back to that in just a moment, 
On the issue of pedestrian safety, the plan as submitted to your board does reflect improvements suggested by the applicant to be um, brought into it. What we're indicating is clear marking on the private driveway, which has walkways on each side for pedestrians marked to a crosswalk that takes them to a crosswalk away from the Route 9 driveway and gets people from the 820 Boston Turnpike side to the 810 Boston Turnpike side and vice versa. The suggestion that somehow parking is insufficient is respectfully not fully consistent with the whole record. Despite the interpretation that I just outlined of the bylaw that parking is not required by special permit here, in fact, the most recent use, other use of 810 Boston Turnpike uh, did not have to come to this board, but did go to the planning board for such a special permit. And that involved the temple or house of worship that uh, went forward at that time. Obviously, that's a much larger use. It involves much, much more traffic coming to and from the site in a very intense period. The planning board heard that and issued a decision in March of this year in which the board found traffic and pedestrian circulation have been reviewed by town staff and the planning board and have been deemed acceptable. So the, the record simply doesn't support the concept that somehow there's a problem out there, nor does the existence of my client, if the use variance were to be allowed, um, suggest that all of a sudden that would create the problem because as you can see on the parking plan, there is sufficient parking in front of the site for the use, certainly, uh, particularly when one talks about the Monday uh, or the evening hours that uh, Ms. Spitzer touched on and also the weekend hours. What I would suggest in a, what's now become a long-winded way to say it would be that the issue with regard to the interpretation of the bylaw be addressed if this board were to grant the variance that either the building inspector determined the special permit's not required, or town council opined to that fact, or the applicant goes to gets the special permit, rather than trying to argue it here in some fashion. Um, we'll talk with Ms. Sheehan about it. If we can't resolve it, we'll ask town council to weigh in on interpretation of what the bylaw says, and we'll live by whatever that is. And if it says go get a special permit, we'll have to go get it as a condition of the, of the use variance if this board's inclined to grant it. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Board members. Um, sure, I'll start. Um, thank you, Attorney Donahue, for um, your presentation. I, um, I don't have a problem with the use variance as I agree that that, particularly where there's the um, indoor activity center for children, I mean, it seems like it's all sort of consistent with the way the property is being used, so I don't have so much an issue with that. I do see the safety concern I was wondering, as far as parking, I wonder if you could um, explain the parking diagram we have. Is the shaded area, that walkway, is that an actual sidewalk or is that just painted stripes on the ground? It, it doesn't exist today. It's a, it would be added as part of the uh, application here. Okay. And that would be limited to markings on the on the ground. Markings, painted, okay. Reflective paint on the ground. So, I, 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 so thank you for clarifying that. I, I do tend to agree with the um, zoning enforcement officer that that, you're, it's the, the driveway from Route 9 is right there and you'd be basically left to be walking on the pavement on this painted area. I hear what you're saying that there's there's likely adequate parking in front of the actual location, but in the event that someone parked over there, that seems like it could be dangerous, uh, particularly in the evening. Um, so I don't know if you have anything else to offer on that. I defer to my colleagues to ask more or say more. The, the point is well taken. It, it's there. It, it to some extent needs to be because what, particularly when you get onto the 810 Boston Turnpike side, there are some significant uh, grade changes. And if you started to talk about a full-fledged sidewalk, it now needs to meet ADA requirements to go up that driveway. Right. Um, and it's... You, you're going to be chasing something that's just simply not going to work for a 4,000 square foot site to be quite crass. So I think, I guess what I'm saying though is I think if you're, if you're asking the board to count those spaces on the other property towards the required number, um, then the access to those needs to be safe. Um, and to say that it just isn't going to work kind of seems to go against your suggestion that that 
as a solution, counting the spaces on the other side. It, it was part of what I was going to say, but the other part of what I was going Go to on. say is, <laughs> is um, in thinking about it and talking with the engineer, we do think we can improve those markings and the crosswalk by s installing at the crosswalk itself uh, an activated, in other words, one has to push the button. Oh, and it flashes. It, it flashes and also the flashing in the pavement so that it'll be clear that someone is crossing at that area because, you know, it certainly in the darker hours it, it could be an issue. We understand that. Yeah. But given the fact that one is entering a parking lot, we would hope that that would be a more than adequate warning to at least bring someone's attention to the fact to be a little bit more cautious than, than other ones. So. Okay, that's helpful. Now, that's just where my head's at. I think, I think it's not unreasonable to count the spaces on the other side, but if we're going to, I think the, the safety issue needs to be really well addressed. So that's all Understood. I have to say. Thank you. Ms. Cassette? Um, I agree with my colleague. I, I'm all for shared parking. I think it's a grand idea. Um, but I do too worry about the safety. I'm not sure if we were to go ahead and grant this use variance, if we can condition that. Um, you spoke about holding off on that and, and working with the building inspector to see if um, you need to go ahead and do the special permit or not. So I'm not sure what our steps would be. So the building, per or the building inspector is going to require a special permit. Um, for shared parking on this site. Now, he, as Attorney Donahue said, there are ways that they may appeal that, mm -hmm. um, but at this point, the enforcement officer is uh, resolute that it will be required. Um, so we don't have to uh, condition anything regarding parking at this point. It's a little confusing because, because of that issue. I, right, and I, I guess my, my advice is, I suppose, if the the board won't this board won't be able to um, provide the level of oversight um, moving forward if the use variance is granted tonight to the improvements on the site. Right. So it was originally the the or and it, I believe it still is the preference of the town is to get the shared parking agreement first. Okay. And then consider the use. Okay. So if the board feels that the the traffic concerns yeah. and pedestrian safety concerns. Yeah. So, so far we have two board members that feel that's a concern. So let's continue with questions. Yeah. And I share my colleagues' concerns. And I also will add um, that I, I'm not sure about ADA parking spots and whether this use would, whether the parking spots that are available there would be sufficient um, under code. Can you, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Um, I, I can't tell you with any specificity with regard to the ADA um, uh, compliance. I can assume that both buildings were and are ADA compliant and have um, accessible parking interspersed in the parking fields that they have. But I can't tell you with specificity how many of those, other than what you can see on the drawing. If you look at the parking layout plan, you can see that there are two accessible parking spaces directly in front of what is essentially my client's site. Um, at 810 Boston Turnpike, that part that, that comes out toward Route 9, the furthest, is the, is the portion of the building she's in. Two of those are marked accessible. I see two marked in the rear is accessible. Um, I, only, I see one, but I, I don't know if that's definitive as to 820. So I think the accessible site's there. Let, let me be clear on, on where, where we're going. Um, the applicant accepts, and I don't think there's any question of the board's authority, to both condition a, a use variance that we make the improvements as submitted as part of our plan with the markings on the sidewalk. And if the board agrees that it makes sense to add the solar-powered, uh, uh, implemented um, crosswalk in some fashion, that will be the rules of the road as to this use variance, no matter what happens. Whether we make a formal appeal of the building inspector who hasn't issued a formal decision yet, we've just been chatting on the phone, whether town council weighs in and has her change her mind, those will stay anyways. If a special permit's required then, anything the planning board adds is on top of that. They can't take that away because it's a condition of the variance already. 
So you can preserve to the extent that we're suggesting improvements and make sure those are the rules, whether the planning board requires other things or not as part of its review of the special permit will be conjecture for when, when and if we get there. Thank you. I think my only concern is just um, conditioning the use variance on, on having those safety features. I would like to know um, what the inspector thinks about whether those are adequate or not. Um, so that would be my only hesitation to voting with a condition tonight. Understood. Kevin. Uh, maybe I missed this in reading, and maybe, Rowan, you can answer this for me. Um, why this is being triggered now? Is this a space that's being divided up, and this is a new space? Is this an existing space already? What's triggering the zoning enforcement officer to bring this forward? So I guess this is a proposed a new use for a tenant on this site. and. The, they have submitted a parking plan that includes uh, a calculation of parking that's this site, 810 and 820. So in doing that, again, it's the zoning uh, enforcement officer's opinion that that requires a shared parking agreement, that there needs to be shown uh, adequate safety to move between both sites. So it's being triggered because they're trying to pull parking from an adjacent yeah. lot. To calculate their parking needs okay. is that clear yeah i guess it, to play devil's advocate i guess a little bit is um why this wasn't a thing for the previous tenant but it is now and if it was sufficient before why is it not sufficient now especially yeah. where it seems like it's such a limited use so yes the there there is another use on that site that had to go through this process and during the review and after it was identified that that level of review by the planning board was unfortunately not meeting the needs of the site or the site had, um, I, it's my understanding at least that, that the, maybe there wasn't adequate review or there was some sort of changes to how the building inspector has understood the conditions on the site that is needing another round of review and because this is a new use um, the the shared parking agreement for the other tenant is only for that tenant um, so this would be a, an agreement between this proposed tenant and uh, the owners well if, if if I might madam chair through you mm -hmm. um, to more specifically to your question this space was previously occupied by a CrossFit training facility the parking requirements for the CrossFit training facility as an indoor recreation, which is one space for every four pe people of capacity and one for every two employees, is a greater parking requirement than retail, which is based upon square footage. By the table submitted to you, this use requires five spaces. That required more. At the five spaces, 810 Boston Turnpike is underparked. It required, it only has 74 spaces and it requires 83 with my client. It required more when there was CrossFit. CrossFit used the cross parking without any of these discussions in any fashion. Site didn't work out. This emptied out. A different space went to the temple. All the parking was on the table then. There was none of this requirement. And now it's being brought to the table with my client. That's not to suggest any malice or anything else. It's just the, the, the record reflects that these two sites have been treated as one for parking over and over again in every fashion that's been used before. And I think the concept of some enhancement for pedestrian uh, safety is always appropriate. But I think here it, we're, we're kind of killing it a little bit, frankly. Um, given that how long this building's been there, how long it's been used, how deficient it is in the parking requirements um, alone, but the parking and the aggregate does work. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes. May I just make a quick announcement uh, sure. for SMC? Anyone who's on the Google Meet right now, could you just mute yourself uh, and, and um, turn off your video, I believe? It was just a request, so thank you. Thank you. 
Turn down who I do have a question. Are both buildings owned by the same entity? They're owned by affiliated entities. Um, they, they, have, they have common ownership and they're managed by the same company, Cutler Management. Can you give us an idea of the use in the other building? What, what is in there? Um, in 820, uh, there is a warehouse um, that um, uh, is over there. And there is an office type of use. Uh, looking at, and I'm, I'm relying upon that for called KMM, but I'm not sure I could tell you exactly what KMM does. Um, and there's also a warehouse used by a company called Red Bull um, that um, takes the majority of the building over there. Thank you. And Ms. McAllister, is there any history? I mean, do we have history of any um, accidents? Is there? I, I don't know that, unfortunately. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> so. Public comments, I guess. Yes, so this is a public hearing. Is there anybody, any other comments from the board yeah. before we move on public? Okay, public hearing. Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to be heard on this? We have a um, Zoom meeting happening, so are we good on that? Um, we're all good. It's not a public. It was just okay. for presentation. All right, presenting. wonderful. All right. So I'm going to leave it up to the board as to how they would like to proceed. Maybe poll each. Uh, do we move to close the public hearing first? Uh, unless you were to continue it, right. you would not close it. So we have to discuss that first, I yes. guess. <clears throat> um, well, I guess my position is the same um, as earlier. I don't think there, I don't see an issue with the use variance. Um, I don't see an issue with shared parking, although I do have the um, safety concerns uh, with it as drawn. And I think one of the cons one of the criteria for a special permit is is uh, public safety, public good. So I would, I guess, I would want to see those things addressed um, as part of the shared parking. And I, I do as well, but I feel that will be addressed during the special permit process, which this appellant is now required to go through. Yeah. So I have no problem granting the use variance as is. Anne? Um, I would like to see some more information about the parking. Um, I'm concerned about public safety. There is a children's jumping facility there, very busy on the weekends, um, so I'd be interested in shared parking agreement. Kevin? I guess I'm kind of inclined to step on the opposite side of this. I mean, it seems like this is a new use that's requiring less parking than what was there previously. The pass-through isn't even a pass-through, it's a dead end leading to other businesses, it's not a through way. The only traffic uh, through this is just the two small buildings behind with even less parking. Um, so I'm inclined to think that the solution that they've brought forward is certainly more adequate than I think they should be required to bring forward. And I think it's a perfectly acceptable solution. I mean, it's going to be, everybody's seen those blinking lights through the downtown of Shrewsbury. They're tough to, tough to miss. So you have another person agreeing with you, <laughs> and I feel the, um, that will be looked at more closely in the special permit process. So I have no problem approving as is. So procedurally, would we just uh, Make a motion. move to approve the variance, and then we'll just deal with the special permit when that application is received? That's what I'm interpreting. So you would have to vote to close the public hearing. No, right, right. But, but it's then. for a variance. So. But after that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not sure about your question, just what the motion would be? Um, yeah. yeah, so we'll or just, it's just move to approve the variance and then we'll deal with the, the special permit when that application comes in. No. Oh. Not going to come in. It's a special permit through the planning board. Okay, I see. So we're off. So you're not going to be reviewing that at all. And I apologize if that was okay. not stated clearer. It's a special permit through the planning board. So our question then is just whether we want to condition the variance on or or let or it or continue. 
yeah or continue it so i would you like more discussion or or can we entertain a motion would you like to oh we got to close public hearing well, first i guess yeah if well, we're not going to continue sure if so. we're not going to continue and i'm I'm fine with no more discussion. Vibe, so I think yeah. we should uh, move to. All right, move to close the public hearing. Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Okay, can I get a motion? I make a motion to approve the variance for section six, table one, for 810 Boston Turnpike Limited Industrial Scrappy Pet Enterprises, Inc., to conduct dog training services within a portion of a building. Can I get a second? Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. So, can we just do roll call vote on that? Just yes. sure. for everyone as a chair as well. Sure. Okay. Peter. Aye. aye. Mary Beth Lynch. Aye. Lisa Bartone. Aye. Ann Rapolo. Nay. Kevin Nisbet. Aye. So moved. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. That was me. Okay, thank you. On to our next 630 hearing. This is here to hear the appeal of McGovern Auto Group Services, DBA, McGovern Collision, 777 Washington Street, Newton, Mass. For two variances and two special permits to the Town of Shrewsbury Zoning Bylaw under Section 6, Table 1, Footnote 9, and Section 4B to reconstruct a non-conforming structure to operate a garage repair shop to store unregistered vehicles on the lot and to have a curb cut within 500 feet of a church upon property located at 420 Boston Turnpike in the commercial business district. The subject premise is described on the Shrewsbury Assessor's Tax Plate 33, Lot 079000. Sounds like we have some technical difficulties. Some more feedback. Are we good? Could I ask the appellant to please introduce themselves and let us know a little bit about why you're Thank you, you to the chair, um, um, members of the board. Uh, thank you for seeing us tonight. My name is Richard Ricker, and I'm uh, the attorney representing the applicant. Um, I'm here with David Mackwell, who is our engineer uh, with uh, Kelly Engineering Group. Um, and we also have John Crandall here in the front row with us um, from McGovern Auto Group. Um, you may recall that we were here um, in February uh, for this very proposal. Some of you will recall. Um, um, and um, as you will note, I attached a copy of the decision from that um, meeting uh, to our application here. Uh, McGovern Auto Group um, wants to um, move forward with a collision center at this location. Um, the collision center would uh, serve uh, its various auto dealerships um, and uh, it, it also would serve as a fit-up center for municipal uh, vehicles, uh, new municipal vehicles, um, which uh, would come out of one of his dealerships as well. Um, as I noted, we, we were last here in February of, um, 28th of uh, this year. Um, and at that time, you may recall, the northeast corner of the site was vacant. Um, and there was a there was a blank in that in the plan at that stage. Well, since that date, um, uh, McGovern Group has um, um, has uh, signed a um, occupant for the, for that portion of the site, uh, floor and decor, and it's a, a Class A occupant, obviously. Um, and so now we're looking at uh, what essentially would be a build out of the whole site, and and this is to bring to you the revised plan um, of the whole site. Um, you will recall, if, if you want me to go through all the criteria like I did last time, I'll be happy to do that. Otherwise, I could uh, address the um, changes in the plan since the last time we were here. Which would you prefer, Madam Chair? I think the changes, given that, I think the changes would be <laughs> fine. Okay, so um, the major changes um, are um, the um, Parking out on Oak Street, uh, which is, uh, and we went to the selectmen uh, a couple of weeks ago, 
um, and they did uh, regrant the license at that time for uh, these uses. And uh, the parking on, out on Oak Street is uh, to be restricted, and, and um, I, I assured them that I would note to you that uh, it should be restricted to new vehicles on, on that particular lot on Oak, at Oak Street. Um, they, they did not want repair vehicles there. Um, frankly, neither did we, so, so that was fine. Um, the other cha change, David, um, so it, it, is the, obviously the floor decor uh, building. You can see that, and we've added uh, parking there, and you'll see uh, the parking is delineated, delineated by different colors. Um, David, if you want to run through that. Sure. So in essence, the only a change that the zoning board needs to, um, to weigh in on, I guess, is a reduction in the special permit to store new cars from another facility at this facility. The previous permit, I think, and the previous license from the Board of Selectmen granted 333 car storage spaces. With the um, floor and decor moving into the previously vacant spot, they take up a number of spaces, 180 something or so. So really what the request is, is a reduction of the new inventory excess parking here for the special permit. The special permit for the Repair use is identical, that nothing has changed with respect to how they're going to renovate the existing building that's there today to become the home of the collision center. Um, we had left a pad out front and in the middle of doing our drawings to finish this off, somebody came and took it. We wish we kind of finished the old permitting first because now we're permitting. And that threw us back to come here again <laughs> and go to everyone again because or of they the would, Or they would be here and, um, and we'd be un under renovation but we're, st we're still not quite to demo yet. So really, in essence, the project has changed by finding a, a spec tenant to take what we were going to leave as a gravel pad. They need some parking. We've added some additional parking in the net from this board is the same special permit for the use and 245 parking spaces excess to be used for vehicle storage, new vehicle storage. And that uh, adjustment right. was made by the selectmen as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that's basically that's it. it. Um, we're here because I, I think we're here basically because of the change of the plan mm -hmm. um, and the addition of the uh, new occupant, which is floor and decor. So um, the the issues remain the same as they did back in February. Um, the entrance being at at the low spot at that spot on Route 9. Uh, the fact that the collision center is at the rear of, the, of this overall lot. Uh, the size of the lot is certainly a, a consideration. Um, I Granted, uh, we're using it, um, and I think that's good, I would suggest to you. Um, it is, as you can see, a tremendous improvement over what's there now and what has been there for the last um, many years. So with that, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Rowan, anything to add? Uh, just that this applicant worked uh, with our zoning enforcement officer to identify the color-coded parking. Um, I think that's a helpful um, mm -hmm. attachment for the board members to reference and certainly makes clear the parking uses on the site. Peter. Um, nothing for me at this time, thank you. Lisa? Uh, no. I have no issue with this I just wanted to clarify when you when you mentioned attorney Ricker uh, Oak Street parking it's parking that is adjacent to Correct. Oak Street not on Oak Street just it's for at the those watching. I meant to say at the Oak it's adjacent to the Oak Street entrance yeah thank you and thank you. Um, that is designated now just for uh, new vehicles the new vehicles they'll just be parked there there's no building there correct um, and I have no issue. Thank you. Correct. Ann? I don't have anything. Thank, thank you. you. Kevin? No comments either. Great. My only comment is thank you for improving the site. It is mm -hmm. vastly mm -hmm. overdue, and mm -hmm. we appreciate the uh, investment in, in the town that you're making. So that's my comment. Thank you. Um, this is a public hearing. Is there anyone that wishes to be heard on this matter? All right. Can I entertain a motion, please? I move to close the public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Okay, so we have. Thank you, Dave. Two variances and two special permits. 
Who would like to take a <laughs> you want this one, Lisa? jab at this one? <laughs> Lord, I'll try. Let Lisa do this. Okay, I'll try. All right. Uh, I make a motion to approve two variances and two special permits to the Town of Shrewsbury Zoning Bylaw under Section 6, Table 1, Footnote 9, and Section 4B to reconstruct a non-conforming structure, to operate a garage repair shop, to store unregistered vehicles on the lot, and to have a curb cut within 500 feet of a church upon property located at 420 Boston Turnpike in the Commercial Business District. Can I get a second? Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. All right. Thank Unanimously. You Thank, Thank you very, very much. much for your time. Thank you. That worked. Okay. Yeah, there's two there's different. There's four. Oh, there's two sheets. Two sheets. Okay. <coughs> Just two. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Moving on to our next public hearing. This is to hear the appeal of Bach Shrewsbury Worcester LLC, 111 Morse Street, Norwood, Mass, 02062, for two special permits and a variance to the Shrewsbury Zoning Bylaws, Section 6, Table 1, and Section 7, Table 2, to locate a sales room for automobiles and a garage and repair shop, and to park inventory and display vehicles with a non conforming setback upon property located at 701 and 713. Boston Turnpike in the Commercial di Business District. The subject premise is located on the Shrewsbury Assessor's Tax Plate 34, Plot 077, 000, and Tax Plate 35, Plot 00600. So, we're waiting for our engineer. Um, I'm surprised he's not here, um, Patrick Healy. Um, this is Mike Clemmy. He, he's the um, Vice President of um, Real Estate Development for Bark uh, Shrewsbury Worcester. Um, and Patrick. Speak of the devil. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> you left us hanging, Patrick. Incredible timing, really. <laughs> so while he's um, getting ready. Together. <laughs> did, uh, Ms. McAllister, did he send you the uh, information? He did. He just sent me a revised plan. Yeah. Does that sound right? And it's yep. in the board's packet. Okay. Yes, we have it. Okay, so should I start while we're waiting for him to come in here? Um, I, why don't we start? Yeah. Good. We have... Um, with me tonight, is, uh, as I said, is Mike uh, Clemmy from... Um, uh, Bach um, Subaru of New, of New England. Um, this is Jim Patrick from Patrick um, Motormart, and uh, Patrick Healy from um, Thompson Liston is our engineer of record. Uh, Patrick, can you put, can I put something up on the screen? Yes. Okay. Should I talk while you're doing that? Please do. Okay. Sorry, I, uh, Jim was forward. Jim was still in the hallway, so I didn't know. What's okay. <laughs> so um, this is. Um, a proposal to uh, take the piece of land, which is approximately 25 acres, uh, at the corner of South Street and Route 9, um, and to relocate, uh, basically, Subaru of New England is, is looking to relocate uh, Patrick uh, Motors to that location. Patrick's uh, is presently at about a, a seven acre location down off of Elm Street and, and Route 9. Um, they uh, basically out of space. Um, it, is, uh, it has caused some issues for them and the neighbors in the past, so um, this is a site that they would love to move to. Um, and Subaru of New England would love to move them there. They're one of the top producers for, for Subaru of New England. Uh, they've won uh, several awards uh, within their industry. And um, I would also note that uh, Patrick has, as does Subaru of New England, has uh, a great um, record of being a good neighbor and, and corporate leader in terms of uh, charitable contributions and, and um, organ organizational health uh, within the communities that they serve. Um, this site uh, was purchased about, what, a year ago? Yes, sir. About a year ago yes. for uh, over $8 million. Um, the um, facility that we're looking to locate here uh, would be on about 
14 of the 25 acres. Um, the facility itself is a 54,692 square foot facility, so it's a good sized building. You're talking about the investment of millions of dollars into Shrewsbury to begin with, and then couple that with some more millions of dollars in investments going into the building and, and the facilities here. Uh, not to mention, not to mention uh, uh, the eventual tax benefits to the community, uh, both in real estate taxes for a $20 million facility, as well as um, the, um, as we've talked about uh, with other dealerships, uh, the other types of taxes, excise taxes are one of them, for instance, and the personal property taxes that um, kick off very good income for the communities. Um, and and it, it has done so in Shrewsbury. Uh, this is a re request for a special permit uh, for uh, the auto sales and garage repair shop. Um, the, um, the site, as I said, maybe you can pull it up on the screen. I'm having trouble logging in. I okay, okay, the site itself. Um, as I said, we've got 14 acres uh, that would be developed towards the Route 9 uh, side of the site. Um, the rear portion of the site will remain wooded. Um, the, um, there is a sizable buffer around uh, this particular building, I would, I would point uh, out. Um, the closest residences, we're talking about um, for the for Maplewood um, condominiums, for, for instance, one of them, I think the closest uh, that they are is about 700 feet, Patrick? 700, uh, well, sorry. Six, uh, the distance? Oh, the Maplewood condominiums is 420 feet away, okay? Uh, actually, sir, uh, because of this change, it became 380. 380, okay. The, Closest Brentwood residence uh, is 781 feet away. That's uh, up in, in the rear, to the rear of the property. Now this is a state-of-the-art building. Um, we're talking about a, a building that uh, even the service areas are gonna be fully HVAC. Uh, you're gonna see um, a door closure an, an awful lot in a building like this uh, because in the summertime they're gonna keep the air in and in the wintertime they're gonna keep the heat in. Um, you've got two doors to access the, the service bays. Um, it, uh, I would suggest to you this lends itself to uh, the issue of noise and the question of noise and I would suggest that uh, you're going to have the repair work and, and the service work for these cars is going to be inside um, and so therefore I would suggest there's no nuisance value there whatsoever. Um, in terms of the lighting, it is going to be uh, dark sky uh, lighting. Um, so you're not going to see any spill uh, onto neighboring properties. Uh, you wouldn't anyway with, with that amount of land behind this facility relative to the Brentwood subdivision, but um, it still is dark sky uh, illumination, and uh, so we would expect that there would be no spillage off the site. Um, as far as um, uh, the traffic um, implications of this uh, particular um, project, um, we have submitted a traffic study. Uh, there, there, um, the conclusion of the study is that there is no significant uh, impact of this facility on uh, the traffic as it is going to be um, once the facility is fully built out. Uh, so, and we do have our traffic engineer with us. Um, um, Maureen McHugh is sitting, sitting in, the, in the front row. Uh, so if we have any questions for her particularly, she's here to help us um, in that area. Now, in addition to the um, special permit request that in, that's in front of you, because we don't have um, anything in the bylaw, and we've experienced this before, um, relative to display spaces um, and, and whether they require um, setbacks or, or not, um, therefore, because there's nothing in the bylaw, they do. Um, so. Uh, we're asking for relief uh, from the bylaw uh, for, by variance for the display and inventory uh, that is showing on the plan uh, down along Route 9 and South Street. Uh, Patrick, if you can address that. How many spaces are we dealing with here? So we have 15 display spaces immediately along Route 9. Then we have a number of inventory spaces uh, Approximately six spaces are in the required front yard district. 
And then down along South Street, there are two display spaces within the front yard. So the reason why I would suggest to you that this is, uh, it's appropriate to ask for a variance for this is because the topography of that site is uh, rather extreme as you go up the hill. Um, and as you will note, um, and we're all familiar with that uh, particular corner, um, <coughs> South Street and Route 9 are substantially lower than this site itself. Now the site's going to need to be terraced, um, as you can see from the plans. Um, and as you terrace up, up a hill and up a site, um, you know, you lose sight of various things. And uh, probably the most important of which is uh, your vehicles and, and your, your <coughs> beautiful building that you're going to build there. Um, but uh, as all re auto retailers would want, um, um, they would like to have at least some display and some inventory. Uh, insight of, of Route 9 and, and South Street so that um, it acts as, as a secondary here we are type of um, sign basically. Um, and, and it's important for them to uh, let people know that they're there. Um, I would suggest to you that um, it, does, it, it, it does not block any views or anything like that coming in or out of the site. Um, it does, therefore it doesn't derogate from the intent of the bylaw whatsoever because uh, not, not only does the bylaw not address it, but it doesn't cause any harm. Uh, there, there's no harm uh, to anyone uh, by virtue of uh, these being terraced up a little bit and then, and then you terrace further back. As you can see, and as I said, everything on this site requires terracing. Um, and I would suggest there's no nuisance value to this either. Um, and so there's no harm to the um, um, property, to the neighborhood, or to the general public as a result of this. Um, and it is also incidental to, to just this site. This, this particular problem is, if you look up and down Route 9 there, th th this site has, uh, uh, it's, it is um, conspicuously alone in this respect. So um, I would suggest to you that it, it is appropriate uh, subject for a variance, and I would ask you to so consider that. Um, with that, if, uh, Patrick, if you want to address some of the uh, parts of the plan, that would be helpful. I'm sorry we can't have it up on the screen. Yeah, I apologize. I'm having uh, difficulty with my uh, laptop, so I can't show them. But you do have the plans that we submitted. I can, I can the, try to get was, mine, but... There was a couple of minor modifications that have been made since the time the plans were submitted to you. At the, um, the uh, right-hand side of the plan, uh, sort of the northeast corner of the building, there was an exterior space between the cleanup bays and the dumpster uh, alignment that that has yes. now been uh, excuse me for one second yeah um i can put the site plan up on the tvs if got it i just based on the number of people in the room i think it would be helpful yeah. sure Good sure idea. and we have all of that i would appreciate that so. do you want to use my laptop for that uh no because you, yours doesn't have the hdmi so let me okay. just right yep I was going to take one it. second to I was gonna do it by Zoom get the again. revised site plan up. <clears throat> it's up to you. you. Want to do that? It's up to you. You're doing your notes. I mean. Yeah. Um, how fast would it take you to pull? Uh. It? <laughs> <laughs> again, I apologize. I didn't do a dry run after I made up the uh, thumb technical drive. mistakes are the hardest ones, <laughs> right? <clears throat> One thing that I uh, did fail to point out when, when I started this uh, discussion is this is a commercial business zone. Um, and, and the uh, subject site that you're looking at and, and all of the uh, development that you're looking at is within this commercial business zone. Thank you. All right. All right. We have it up. Hopefully. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, there on the screen, you can see to the northeast corner of the building, there was about a 40-foot expansion of that uh, to close the gap between the building and the dumpster enclosure that now will be part of the cleanup bay for the um, uh, facility. So for the record, I'm Patrick Healy of Thompson Liston Associates, Madam Chair. Um, so this adds a, uh, a slight increase in the square footage that was shown on the previous plan. So the total square footage uh, gross floor area is 50,000. 57,862. Um, that does not change the building coverage percentage uh, because it was less than a 1% change. As proposed, the building coverage was 4%. This puts it at about 4.2, so it doesn't get to the next percentage point. 
Uh, we also added some dimensions to the plan uh, showing the distance from the front yard sep uh, property line to the signs at the, quest, at the request of Ms. Sheehan. On the Route 9 pylon sign, the setback would be 21.5 feet. And along South Street, uh, the setback is 22.5 feet. Minimum side uh, sign setback is 20 feet. And the required setback for buildings is 40 feet. And then I would like to point out a couple of minor changes to the parking uh, summation. We still have an overall count of 600 vehicles on the property. Um, we added an, an additional category here um, that shows, uh, so we're separately breaking down sales, uh, customer sales at 18 spaces, customer service at 61 spaces. Uh, we've increased the number of employees based on our discussion with uh, uh, the folks from Patrick. So that's currently at 77 spaces, which reduces the overall inventory to 418 autos. And then there are, uh, as we dis as Mr. Ricker mentioned earlier, 26 autos in the um, display spaces as one approaches the site from either driveway. So those are shown in those uh, crosshatch areas. Again, there are two display vehicles down at the South Street entrance. There are two as one approaches the facility coming up the hill to the first plateau. And then entering from Route 9, there are uh, 15 spaces right along the frontage. And then there are two islands that would have a, a, a durable grass finish that would have um, three vehicles on the left, four on the right. Um, if I could just mention some information about the site generally. Um, there's about a 52-foot grade difference as one approaches the building from South Street. So we have a fairly steep driveway that's about uh, 5 to 6 percent at its steepest uh, part to allow for the uh, uh, auto delivery trucks to, to navigate that. Um, and there is an S-curve in the roadway to try to blend the, the grade of that roadway into the hillside. Um, as one approaches the building from Route 9, there's about a three-foot drop from that curb cut to the uh, service entrance. So we're trying to pick, a, pick an average grade of the building such that we're minimizing the amount of material that has to be removed from the site. Um, that being said, there is still a significant volume of earth to be moved, and there are some significant slopes and retaining walls required to develop the site. So at its deepest point, um, where you see the three rows of parking on the left side of the, the plan there, there's about a 36 to 38 foot cut from natural grade with a steep slope coming down, essentially to create that first plateau. Then there's a six foot drop to the next plateau. There's an eight foot drop to the floor, uh, building floor grade. And then coming down towards South Street, there's another six to eight foot drop. And then at the low, the low end of that sort of series of plateaus, we still have a significant uh, height of fill. Um, so the, the, the sort of cut fill line, if you will, where we're blending the floor grade into the hill sort of cuts diagonally through the building. So for the most part, the building foundation will be on natural grade. And then that retaining wall down closest to South Street is about uh, 28 to 29 feet high. Um, <clears throat> And as I said, the terraced effect as you crawl up the hill. So then um, the monument sign along Route 9 is placed at the high point of the hill. So vehicles approaching the site from either direction have uh, the clearest uh, sight distance to that sign. Um, that's about 27 feet high. Um, the bylaw, I believe, allows 30 feet. And the monument sign at the driveway uh, approaching from Route 9 to South Street to that entrance uh, there's a ground mounted sign that's about nine feet high and 11 feet wide. And we have provided details of those signs showing that the overall signage, the area of all the signage, both these two signs and the building mounted signs um, is only about 10% of what the uh, zoning bylaw would allow. So you know, we're not overly signing the place, but we're providing enough signs to allow people to navigate and find their way within the site and approach either the service or sales area. I would note, um, if I could, Madam Chair, just a couple other items. Mm -hmm. um, as far as uh, test drives for vehicles coming in and out of the site, um, it's the intent that the, uh, they would occur going in and out of the Route 9 uh, entrance and exit. 
um, and uh, we don't have any problem with a condition to that effect. Um, and uh, with regard to sound um, and, and any other noise issues, I would point out that, uh, that they also do not use any outdoor speakers or intercoms or anything of that nature at, at their facility. Um, and so uh, there is not going to be any issue of, of that type either. Yeah, so. And with regard to trash pickup, uh, they don't allow the uh, trash company to come before 7.30 a.m. Just to address what we always know is something that is a question. Mm -hmm. But with that, uh, if you have any other questions, if you have any questions, we'd be pleased to try to answer them. Thank you. Ms. McAllister. All right. Yeah, so uh, just to really quickly summarize, right, this is a special permit for a salesroom of automobiles and a garage and repair shop and the variance for display of vehicles uh, and inventory and the setbacks. Um, this will be going before the planning board as well. Um, and um, in fact, they alluded to it, they have a parking report uh, done and the planning board is um, uh, in the process of getting their reviewer to look at that report. So. Um, I might advise the board that if that report is of significance to you in your decision making, um, potentially to wait for that review to come back as well. Um, I will also share that the planning department met with a handful of abutters uh, regarding this pro uh, property um, just to talk through some of the procedural steps that this, that this uh, site will be going through, again, just Board of Selectmen licensing, ZBA licensing, and then planning board um, plan review. So um, I believe that's that's it on the town side. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Peter. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, very helpful. Um, I grew up on Lamplighter Drive. Um, I would say, so I'm very sensitive to the concerns that, that residents of um, this area have. Um, grew up playing in those woods. I, it's regrettable that they'd be cut down, but I think um, if there's a place that's appropriate, it's along Route 9. Um, I'm glad to hear that um, dark skies are part of the plan. I think light pollution is a really legitimate concern. Um, I think one thing that stands out to me in terms of the variance as far as the display vehicles, is it 26 display vehicles? Is, do I have that? Did I count that up correctly? <clears throat> um, through the chair, all of the 26 uh, are not within the front yard setback. Okay. So there but are. It's, it there is are, part of the. Oh. It is the variance, isn't it? To park inventory and display vehicles with a non conforming setback? But not 26. Mm -hmm. But not 26. I see what you're saying. Okay. Um, part of that parking lot is within that setback. Gotcha. So my, my only thought on that is it just seems like an awful lot, um, particularly where the site is going to be terraced. I think from the road, you should be able to see that there are many, many vehicles parked. Um, um, and so that that number of display vehicles seems like a lot. Um, but I'd be interested to what other board members think of that. Um, but I do think a special permit to locate a sales room at this location seems reasonable based on the prevailing uses along this stretch. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Ms. Bartom. Uh, Thank you, great presentation, and thank you for pointing out all the revisions. Um, regarding the, uh, uh, sorry, regarding the special permit, I too think this is a fitting use for this um, property. I'm very pleased to see the distance between um, the neighborhoods and uh, the structure. And so therefore that makes me uh, lean toward approving your variance for displaying the vehicles. I think you've done a great job pushing the structure um, and what you're trying to do toward Route 9. I have to say I'm, um, I have a question about the impact it would be, and I couldn't, I didn't see it in the tra traffic study and Please correct me if I'm wrong, if it was addressed in there, but what would the impact be if, uh, what would the impact be to traffic exiting onto Route 9 
if the access on South Street were made enter only? Hmm. No, that's a big <laughs> question, but please Maureen McHugh from love to McHugh hear what that would do for you. Uh, my name is Maureen McHugh. I'm from McMahon Associates. We completed the traffic study. We did not look into uh, the impacts of an exit only on South Street. I think okay. that's like your question. Yeah, our, okay. our, our study reflected what was on the plan. What was proposed. Yeah. So I just looked at the numbers trying to imagine, and I particularly like uh, figure 13 is a good example. Um, I'm very concerned with people coming out of Price Chopper, making a uh, right turn. So there's at one point on figure 13, there's 75 vehicles making a right out of Price Chopper, if I read it correctly, figure 13. Um, so they would be making a right, and across from them, um, the projection is that 11 vehicles would be turning left out of Patrick Subaru. So maybe that's not a lot, but I know coming out of Price Chopper and turning right, um, well, turning left, forget it. I won't do it. <laughs> but turning right, <laughs> um, you're, it's, it's fun. <laughs> you're, you're trying to get out as quick as you can. But I'm very concerned with two people it's facing real. each other um, coming out. And maybe you could, the engineer could describe how that would work. I, I, they're directly across from each other. So anyway, I, Waiting time is over. my concern is that, and if, if it were, if you could entertain that access being enter only, what would it do to your business? What would it do for the traffic um, coming, on t coming out to Route 9? And then my last concern is about test drives. Um, I, would you entertain a condition? It's hard to enforce, but making sure that your customers only use Route 9 for their test drives. And that's that we can answer yes. OK, yeah. thank you. I'd support that as well. Okay, that's it for now, I think. <laughs> Anne? I share Lisa's concerns about that um, entrance and exit from Price Chopper. It's very difficult to even turn right out of there. Something about the slope coming mm -hmm. down from Route 9, people tend to pull into the intersection, and perhaps the traffic study doesn't reflect that they're there are probably many, many near misses if there are not crashes there. Yeah. So I do have a big problem with those two entrances facing each other. Um, and I'd certainly be interested to see how we could perhaps modify that to make it um, safer. Also, the density of traffic down, heading south down South Street, trying to take a left. I do that every day multiple times. Um, and at rush hour, it's a real problem waiting for the light to turn. Um, so that's a concern that I have. Evan? I share very similar concerns about that South Street exit. Um, <clears throat> I frequent Price Chopper a lot and living on Oak Street myself, take a left out of there every day. And it's, it's difficult. And even on non-peak hours, um, traffic does back up to that Price Chopper entrance exit. So mm -hmm. adding more vehicles there. Um, seems to be an issue that would just compound on itself, um, especially trying to take a left out of there. And if you've got five cars trying to take a right out of um, a dealership here, it would be virtually impossible to ever take a left there. Um, so I greatly appreciate any further information um, that could be provided on that, or even exploring plans of putting, pushing the entrance further down. Not that residents would like that, but it may make mm. things easier uh, on that intersection. Not that two intersections closer to each other is, or uh, offset like that is great either, but I think getting away from that Route 9 intersection may be a benefit. Um, I do share the concerns about the uh, display vehicles as close as they are to Route 9. I don't know if um, the appellant can share or has any information. I know the, what is it, the Audi and Mercedes dealerships and the Kia dealership, I think that's there. Um, I don't know if they've gone to the board. I think the Kia was recent. Mm -hmm. I think I sat in any of those. Mm -hmm. Were they in a similar? They've received oh. similar, similar treatment. Yeah. Okay, and then I'm inclined to be okay with it if they've uh, received similar treatment because uh, we've seen it um, just down the road. So variances may have been granted for display vehicles, but to Mr. McCall, oh, sorry, um, 
to the question earlier, was it you, Peter? I okay. don't know, <laughs> about number. Yeah, there's yeah, just so a lot of them, that's all. The yeah. number, um, I don't have a, an opinion myself on that, but perhaps others do. Um, I'm, I have no problem with having display vehicles within the setback, but the, the number we could discuss. Madam Chair, could I address that question? Yes, please. So the, the zoning bylaw is a little gray in this area. So mm -hmm. it's our opinion that parking lots can be placed at 10 feet of setback mm -hmm. with a landscape strip. So the, in, the interpretation of the building inspector is that because it's a display vehicle, it's part of the use and has to meet the front yard setback. Thank you. So mm -hmm. there's still a vehicle there, mm -hmm. but we are setting it back over 20 feet mm -hmm. where we could be 10 feet if it was a parking space. If it was a parking lot. space. This Fair is enough. the irony of the, mm. the, the, the zone. <laughs> Makes sense. Okay. That actually changes the way I feel about it a little bit. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I'm not going to belabor any more points until after we hear public commentary myself. So um, anything else from the board? No. Nope. Okay. All right, so it's a public hearing. If you would wish to be heard on this matter, I'm going to ask that you keep your comments um, concise in honor of all of our time. And um, I invite you to the mic. Please introduce yourself by name and address so we can have you as part of the record. Please. Hi, my name is Martin Green. I live at uh, 237 South Street, which is the Maplewood Complex. Um, my wife and I have lived there for 20 years, and when we moved there 20 years ago, there were no grocery stores, drug stores, car dealerships, uh, storage facilities, or anything. It was very easy to uh, maintain the quiet enjoyment of our property. Um, over the years, that's gotten more difficult. We have all those things now, all that commercial development, and the uh, traffic situation is is very, very difficult right now. Um, Maplewood is 52 units, and we each have two deeded parking places. So that's potentially 104, if my math is right, 104 cars at any one point in time trying to get in and out of that um, uh, driveway. Um, so the, uh, in, in looking at the site plan, there's going to be an entrance and exit on South Street it's impossible to think that that's not going to increase traffic and uh, increase congestion. It's, it's certainly going to be a problem. We also have a lot of concerns about what, what is the environmental impact. There's a lot of wetlands around there. This is a major uh, construction project. Um, right across Brentwood, there's, uh, there's wetlands with a lot of wildlife. There's even been, um, I'm not a huge fan of turtles, but there's a turtle crossing right across Brentwood yeah. there. Um, so, you know, that's, that's somewhat of an issue. Um, there's noise, there's lights, there's dust, dirt. Um, all of these things are going to have an impact on, on, our, uh, on our ability to, as I said, enjoy the quiet uh, uh, aspects of our property. So we have some serious concerns about it. Um, the, um, I think we're wondering, um, as a, as a community, uh, why there has to be an entrance and exit on, exit on South Street. And a, a suggestion, I think, was to move that further north. That, uh, I may have mis misunderstood what you said, but if that's the case, that'll really compound our problem getting in and out of South, uh, in and out of our complex. It's difficult now, um, and you mentioned, I mean, you almost have to turn right, even if you want to turn left, uh, and it's going to be much more difficult. So um, those, are, those are just some of uh, the concerns we have. Thank you. Thank you. Sir? Hi, my name is Abhijit Mandari. I live in Maplewood Condes too. Uh, I heard that the South Street entrance exit is going to be used for the delivery trucks. I don't see how that can make a turn on South Street without blocking at least two lanes of traffic right now. Even right now on Price Chopper, when a delivery truck goes there, it blocks the traffic every time, and that's at night. So if there are going to be delivery trucks on the South Street exit and entrance, I don't see how that's even going to make that acute turn, especially in the snow if there's a slope coming down, as they already mentioned. 
So that's a real concern. I think along with the test drive, if they could at least commit that no delivery trucks would ever come on the South Street entrance and exit, I think that makes perfect sense, at least from my perspective. And uh, uh, I'll echo everything that has already been said on the, con on the congestion side. Uh, as you mentioned, if you move further north, that's going to be right across from the Maplewood entrance, which is not actually shown on the site plan. I don't know if there is an option to exit out of the Brentwood or have an, another entrance and exit on Route 9 because there are two addresses. It's 710 and 713, if I'm not mistaken. There's a house right here on Route 9 right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they could make an exit entrance there itself. And I know the existing location only has one entrance and exit on Patrick Subaru. So I don't know whether they require even two entrances and exits. That would be a question I would want to ask. OK, that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name's Carol Barton. I live at 30 Brentwood Drive. I re reiterate all the concerns about the traffic. And I also want to mention, at the bottom of Brentwood Drive, there's a bus stop. And the children have to cross the crosswalk to get to the bus stop. And a lot of the parents park at the bottom of Brentwood. Because again, you can't get out of Brentwood that easily. And I would just like to question that Attorney Ricker said, you know, there's no negative impact on traffic based on the traffic report. But I'm just really curious how you have a state-of-the-art car dealership and you have over, what, 500 cars parked on this facility. How does that not negatively impact traffic? I just can't imagine its status quo. So I would be curious to see the documentation. What's the traffic flow now? What are the numbers of cars, peak times, off times? And what's the impact of bringing all these people to a state-of-the-art dealership, it has to have an impact. And to just come to a conclusion that there's no impact, I just find that challenging. And I would also question, he's saying there's no environmental impact. OK, prove it. What, you know, how is oh, um, the environmental issue is going to be addressed? Like, we want to know the details. We don't want to just hear a conclusion. And I think us neighbors would just like to understand the depth of this project and how these issues are going to be addressed. Like he mentioned, we're not going to hear noise. Well, what are the hours of the repair shop? You know, just the details of the project, I think, would be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Were they all chair? Madam Chair, I would just add to that, um, if I may. Yes. Go uh, just relating to that comment, it, I also get the impression from um, folks who have spoken that there's concerns about the construction process and the noise from that and the disruption from that and I'd be interested to know just how long um, that would be anticipated to be that might just be helpful for the residents to know if they don't know that already Construction timeline yep okay wonderful sir hi good evening my name is Jamie Lepamardo Jamie Lepamardo I live on 7 Brentwood Drive so I won't repeat a lot of the concerns you've heard because I think we all share the same right um, South Street's definitely a problem bus stop being there congestion trying to get in and out it, it's just a poor it's just a poorly designed entrance exit the noise that we talked about the, the only thing I would add to that if they were going to close doors and things that sounds great but incidental noise car carriers delivering uh, sales weekends things like that it, it's just not so easy as saying we're going to close the doors um, there was a mention of in a butter meeting I'm in a butter and I've never been met with, so I'm not really sure how that, how that played out. Um, the wetlands seem to be on the plan. I believe the, <coughs> was it the town engineer called it out as an outdated uh, survey. The wetlands down there connect, not just for turtles, <laughs> for everybody um, and all the wildlife across the street. Uh, I think overall, I would put it this way. We're really looking and hoping for the town to advocate for a productive you know, dealership being there, if that's what's going to happen. We want good neighbors. We want to be good neighbors. We want them to be good neighbors. So I would hope that, that that's the precedent that we're trying to set. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, could I address one of those yes, comments? Um, on the question about the wetlands boundary and the outdated survey, um, the wetlands were flagged in January of this year and were located by survey. 
the surveyor had an incorrect note on his plan that will be corrected on future submissions. Could you speak up and repeat that, please? Yes, ma'am. So I, I was asking about the, um, or commenting on the comment about the outdated wetland survey. So the surveyor actually located wetland flags in January of this year by survey and put them on the plan. When he wrote the note on the, on the side of the plan, it's incorrect. It has the wrong dates of the survey. So it is a recent wetland survey. We will be filing with the Conservation Commission so for work on, within jurisdiction. Madam Chair, sorry to do this again. May I just ask a related question? Yep. Just very quickly. Um, another thing that I'm picking up on is concern about noise. This this large area here that's undeveloped, it's part of the parcel, will that likely remain wooded? It's certainly for now. But yeah, but I mean the, uh, so like, for example, the, there's, this, that's, hey. there's this. Okay, let's. I mean, it's residentially zoned, so. No, 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 right. So it's I'm not commercially zoned. The, the, uh, my question is really just to get at, people are very, seem very concerned about noise and light and all that sort of thing. This area back here that doesn't plan to be developed on, you know, doesn't have any parking on it, would that likely be, remain forested or is that something that's going to be clear cut? Just in terms of the vegetative buffer is what I'm getting at. Is some of that going to remain or no? It's <coughs> Michael it's Clummy from Subaru, New England. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me tonight. A piece of property is 25 acres. Yeah. And the piece that we're not touching is residential. So that'll stay? It will stay as it is. Okay. We have no plans at this time at all. What we're trying to do is build a state-of-the-art facility for the Patrick family and build it on the commercial zone land right. and leave the residential land alone at this time. We, there's no plans at all for the residential land. Okay. We, we looked up and down Route 9, and we found this piece. And when I originally found it, they showed me plans for there's going to be a mall there. There's going to be about 25 stores there. Yeah. And they could all kinds of craziness going on there. We're going to put one dealership, and it's going to be the best shoes for that piece of property about noise. And I've done a lot of developments. It's limited, limited impact on traffic. We have a traffic engineer to address those questions. Mm, in the report. On the construction, myself personally will be doing it. I've been working for Ernie Bach, which is my brother-in-law at Subaru New England over 30 years. I've been doing these developments all over New England, and we ha have a very, very concern for the neighbors. That's why we do the dark sky. We do the trash at 7.30 at night, at 7.30, after 7.30, so you don't hear the truck going beep, beep, beep. Mm -hmm. We don't have intercoms. At this time, we're trying to develop the piece of property to put the dealership there and be good to the neighbors. Uh, I asked Mr. Richter, Attorney Richter, to get a neighbor, meeting with the neighbors. It just it never came to fruition. I apologize for that to everyone. Um, we want to be a good neighbor. We want them to be a good neighbor also. Um, the doors in the service department, we spend additional monies. It's going to be three seconds. Doors go up, they go down. You can buy regular doors to take about 25 seconds to go up, 30 seconds. This, mm -hmm. this three, three seconds max, limited noise, limited lights. The construction, I'll be there myself. I'm building the same dealership. It's 56,000 square feet in Milford, Connecticut. I have a very, very good track record all over New England where I work. I've built up most of the buildings for Bach on Route 1 in the Auto Mile. Um, we address all the concerns. We want to be good neighbors. To get back about the time, it'll be about 12 months. Uh, it's a very difficult site. Um, we're going to have a lot of site work and, and coming in and out, but we plan on working within the boundaries of the time frames of the town. I think it's uh, 7 o'clock to 5 o'clock. That's when we'll be working. No Sundays at all. And we'll be very respectful for any neighbors. They have anything special going on. I'll leave my cell phone number here. Uh, anyone has a problem, more than likely to uh, call me, ask me. I'll work with them. And uh, we, we want to put, uh, you know, beautification to that piece of property and the Patrick family with a new, new dealership and help the Subaru customers. We are the number two car in New England right now. And uh, we... Um, we go back, give back to the community quite a bit. I know the Patrick family's close to $2 million giving back to local communities, and we, we want to be a good neighbor, and we're here to work with you folks and the neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, Thank you. Very helpful comments. I do want to finish the public portion of this so that we can let everyone that is here to be heard gets an opportunity. Good evening. My name is Connie Kamen. I live at 32 Brentwood Drive. Thank you very much for taking this time. Um, I'm concerned about the, the buffer, how they're going to put up a wall, or if there, it's going to be a fence, 
or a wall or a greenery between their property and the adjacent abutting residential property. Also, there's a possibility for them to expand 30 feet into residential. Uh, I want to know whether they're going up or going to the side, Route 9, when they do go into the residential spaces. Um, also, if ledge blasting is required, how would Bach ensure that our backyard and foundations aren't affected? Well, these are the items that I'm concerned with right now on top of the South Street congestion, which I re really am not looking forward to because already a lot of people already know that there's going to be a lot of problems if this is the entryway and exit to uh, the proposed dealership. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir? Hi, uh, my name is Pashupati Gattu. I live on 237 South Street on Maplewood. Um, so I share the same concerns like everybody about the traffic on South Street. Um, it is very tough to make a left turn out of our property in the morning hours, peak hours. Um, you know, between 7, 7 to 8.39 or evening hours. Um, and then you know, there's a bu the bus stops as well. And uh, you know, the entry and exit on South Street will definitely have an impact on our property. Uh, whether it's you know right across uh, price chopper or you know, towards other side, but I think if there are two addresses on Route Nine, why can't the both the entry exits on Route Nine? Why should it be on South Street? That's one. And then the lighting, um, with the high lighting, definitely it's going to have. You no, know, is there a plan to keep the tree line on South Street so it blocks the light out of this property onto our, our properties? because this highlighting 25, 30 feet lighting is gonna impact our uh, enjoying our properties. And then on top of that, uh, um, the, the you know, traffic lighting and then uh, noise, right? No, yes, the light doors can be closed, but there will be noise with the property, cars coming in, going in, and even the uh, delivery trucks. So I live on, in Maple, right? Price Chopper has some rules that were agreed upon, which I was not there uh, whether to build. But the, I was told the Price Chopper delivery trucks only come at certain times. But I, I hear the trucks come in mid, around midnight or early hours, which is disturbing our sleep. I'm sure this is <coughs> going to happen. But all the promises may be made now. But how do we ensure they are kept up? That's all. Thank, Thank you, you. sir. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to continue with public okay. comments if we could and then get to that later. Uh, anyone else that wishes to be heard, please? Uh, hi, I'm Rajni from 237 South Street, Unit 6 Maplewood. Um, we have already experienced a lot of accidents uh, while our entry, exit, entrance uh, in the South Street. And it's not only about that. I'm here to represent all those women who are not working, staying home all day. I agree, men go home, go to office, they, they leave in the morning, come in the evening, that's fine with them. It's their concern. But we as a woman who are not working, staying at home, all day we are at home. When we go towards our bedroom, we hear root, root nine noise. Here we hear South Street noise. Where do we have peace at home? Right? It's, it's about the light, it's about the traffic, it's about the noise. These are my concerns. I don't know how you address them. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Sir, um, is, yeah, if you could just heard. allow anyone else that has not been heard yet, if you don't mind. Thank you. In one minute, I've got somebody else. Please. No, no. You Yes. Thank you. Hello. Dr. Zachary Kamen, pediatric anesthesiologist. I've been working as an attending physician at UMass for about five years. I also bought my uh, second Subaru at Patrick dealership when we first moved out here. <laughs> Thank you. It's an excellent car. I deal with a lot of pediatric traumas at UMass, and I need a car to get me in this, uh, through the snow reliably um, at short notice to deal with any traumas, which we do see. Uh, one thing I want to bring up with the um, entrance on South Street is, you know, I've brought my Subaru to Patrick multiple times to have it fixed, usually at around 7 in the morning, and there is a long line of cars waiting to get into the garage. And I imagine with a larger uh, service bay, that line may be much larger. There's probably going to be more booked appointments. And uh, this 7, 7.30 time is around the time that the kids are waiting for the bus stop, and I think this is just a recipe for disaster. 
And so I would strongly advise as a physician who sees kids, I had one die over the summer, hit by a car. It does happen. And I would strongly recommend that we do not have any sort of entrance of any kind on South Street. Yes, our governor. Thank you. Thank you. Sir? My name is Venkata Galguri. I am a uh, uh, resident of uh, Maplewood. So I moved in, in uh, last year, December. So right now, whenever I take a left to South Street, most of the time, 90% of times, I take left along with my son. Always I feel I'm taking very risky turn because I don't get enough gap. So I try to squeeze in between the gaps I get. So if a uh, entrance is made on South Street, I can imagine it is going to be compounded most likely I will. St I need to stop taking left and go right and uh, get onto route 140 somehow, right? I think that is the only way. So other thing about the traffic, I have one comment. Um, <coughs> so it is like a three lane on the South Street. So what I would imagine is somebody is coming onto South Street, they would be trying to get onto the leftmost lane from the rightmost. So they will try to cut two lanes. So if the entrance is not stopping, so the traffic uh, uh, study, whatever is has been done, whether it is considering that fact, most of the people will be trying to get onto the leftmost lane when they're coming out of this uh, dealership. That is one question I have. Uh, other one is, uh, I think, from our property to the uh, dealership, there is 380 <coughs> feet that is being there. So just I would like to listen. Uh, I want to hear like whether it is left by the uh, dealership or is it how much is already there and how much buffer is left by the dealership. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. He's wondering about buffer over here. Huh? Anyone else with another comment that has not been added, sir? Yeah. Hi, I'm Vijay. <laughs> so I'm from Maplewood. I don't want to repeat, I think most of them are done. And uh, the other concern I had is now we have the hill at the Brentwood Road, and which is uh, the peak hill, and uh, where the water, the snow, everything comes in. And there is also the forest area. And uh, now we are on the Maple Road. Now if it is blocked, and if there is a flat surface now, and if all the snow and water comes in, I don't know where it gets in or I don't know whether if that is taken care or, uh, and also of the animals or, or whatever that I think uh, somebody has brought up or uh, all those things. But this water and ice, right, snow, so that could come in. And uh, again, the kids there and also the left, so which is again added to it. So because of the ice uh, during the snow is when I have uh, seen accident in my own family, so the car couldn't stop, it just moved because of the black ice. It, even if you apply brake, it doesn't stop. So it will be the same issues. And if you don't have uh, anything to stop because of the trees and other things, now the water, everything is stopped. Our snow has been stopped there. That's it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before I allow someone to go second, uh, is there anyone else new that has more comments that we have not spoken of? <clears throat> David Singer, 400 South Street. I didn't really plan to talk to this meeting. As we all know, I have another one following this, but just <laughs> hearing this, the entrance on South Street, perhaps similar to what you're doing on our end of South Street, where there are no 18-wheeler tractor trailers being allowed to turn in or out of South Street. They have to use Route 20, so maybe restrict them on, route, uh, on South Street just to Route 9. What I'd like to address here also, I'm sure all these residents, everybody that uses this intersection, is I call it getting emergency you can be sitting at this light waiting to turn for three minutes and all of a sudden an ambulance comes down from Westboro, overrides the light cycle, and instead of it going back to where it should go to, it circles back to probably east-west and you can be sitting there six, seven you know, minutes. It's difficult now if you're gonna increase the traffic in that intersection. I'd really like to see if the town can work with the state, how you can default those lights to go back to whose ever turn it is to, to go next. I've sat there sometimes twice you know, three intersections. Come to this meeting, I was hoping that that wouldn't happen. Um, and those would be my comments as far as blasting, that's down the road. We sustained five months of blasting for 
the Centec North site. It sits on a parallel ground. I would just say to these folks, be very leery of blasting. There will be rock at Shrewsbury. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else new? No one else new. Second bite at the apple for you. I just wanted to echo that. Could you um, please step forward? So, uh, this is based on the comment about the 12 month construction uh, timeline mm -hmm. that the same restrictions that we would request for the delivery trucks should apply to the construction vehicles as well, please. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think I, I just would like to summarize some of the traffic report if I um, <laughs> that'd be great. Do that we want to no. close public commentary. <coughs> I think we should. You wouldn't want to oh, close they, if you wanted to continue. Yeah, they have to. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. The, the only other thing I will say is that the town hasn't had a, our, the town's reviewer hasn't had a chance to look at the traffic report yet. So we'll hear that next time. So yeah, S next meeting we would be able to have both the report and the review in front of them. Okay. Will right. you be here at next meeting? Sure. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and we do have a very comprehensive traffic study that was just brought to our attention yes. in the last 24 hours, and it's 124 pages long. Um, there's no way that we could have reviewed it. So um, mm -hmm. I am inclined to, to jump forward um, yes. to, um, I think I know what the temperament of the board is just by the shaking of the head, I think we're going to look for a continuation of this hearing um, so we can review all of the commentary that has been made, um, certainly, and I think that you've heard it as well. So um, I don't want to be the only one. Am I, yes, I'm reading the room correctly? Yes, that would be great. So I'm going to ask for uh, a motion to continue the hearing, please, to our next date, which is. As long as you don't need any appellant, appellant or, or they need to make any kind of response. Yeah, they, um, so, uh, to yes. answer any of those, you would have to do now. Okay. Yeah. So. In other words, so to respond to any of the public comments. We've got a lot of comments. Yeah, yeah. sure. We, we, well, we, you want to you want to walk through answers to what you have? I mean, if you're going to continue this, maybe we can come back and, and kind of address the things in, a, in an orderly fashion. I mean, we're prepared to address some of them now. I know you have questions about the traffic report. Um, I, th yeah, I mean, Which yeah. yeah Which I think we... Sure, Mike. Board. Just just real quick, on, on the trucks, I hear you loud and clear. We're a different type of car, car company. All the car companies that I've been affiliated with when we had the retail stores, we've sold all our retail stores besides Ferrari, Maserati. And the car carriers do come in all kinds of crazy times. They have, uh, they leak hydraulic fluid, they leak oils, they leak everything. I can sit here this evening and feel very comfortable about our car carriers. We own them. I personally purchase them all. They're all, the, they're all black trucks, they're Peterbilts, they're uh, state of the art. None of them are four years old. They hit three, 400,000 miles. These trucks are good for two million miles. They're all diesel. Their trucks are perfect. There's no leakage. That, and we control the delivery of all the vehicles, and all those deliveries will be done during working hours. And so all the concerns on the trucks, and, and I talked to the attorney, Richter, we'll have a meeting with the neighbors, and I apologize once again not for having that before we meeting you folks, but on the trucks, I can guarantee you, they'll be done delivered during the day. There won't be any midnight or late at night or any of that. They'll be all during the day. At the lighting, one thing on the lighting, I understand that, but we've designed this to be dark sky. One thing we didn't mention was one hour after closing, the way I design it and the way we go forward is we don't want to pay, and Mr. Papp don't want to pay, for lights on all night long. And so I wire each light differently. And so then after one hour you close, we only keep a third of the lights on, number one for safety, number two for thievery. And, you know, we'll have uh, a security camera system up there, but we don't need to keep every light burning all night long. So we close at 8 o'clock. We'll open at 7 in the morning till 8 o'clock at night. If we, if we uh, close at 8, the lights will stay on the 9. After 9 o'clock, they'll go down to uh, one-third of the lights right there. Um, there's a lot of other questions, but, I, you know, I'd, I'd like to set up a meeting with all the neighbors and, 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 and bring some coffee and some donuts and talk about <coughs> it. And, and I think we can resolve a lot of the issues. Yeah. yeah. I'm not the expert on the traffic, so I'll let that go with the traffic expert. But we, we can really work on all these issues. Here. And in in the past, when you've set up meetings with neighbors, how just give me an idea of when you think that could happen. Well, well I, I, had, I had reached out to who I thought was the neighborhood liaison. Um, 
Um, but I didn't get anywhere with that. So, I mean, we're, we're prepared to meet within days. Uh, so I, I've, I've done it different ways. I've done it at night after work and, 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 and do it or a Saturday morning down to the library, uh, bring a tent up, do it right on site. <laughs> Wherever it's convenient for the neighbors, any Saturday, no Sundays, you know, uh, church day for me. So uh, whatever's good for the neighbors, usually a Saturday morning, and, and we can come in, meet, and talk, and, and try to work together and resolve some of these issues. Maybe you could drive into Price Chopper, see how the traffic is. Once again, Madam Chair, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a traffic expert, and that's why I'm not a traffic expert. I understand. But we're, we're willing, we want to work with everyone. We want this to be a successful project for us. We appreciate Patrick that. Patrick family, for you folks and the neighbors, something we can all be very proud of and, and uh, you know, serve the community, Subaru. That could go, yeah, that could go a long way, I think. Right. Absolutely. Um, if it's a comment, I have somebody in the back that wants to make a comment. If you could make it brief, please, and to the point, great. Thank you. We all received a letter saying that we are in the vicinity of 300 feet, and there's a comment made saying that the our community is 380 feet. So there is a disconnect in what we received versus what we said here. I see. I okay, so if we could look into that. He's so saying... We, uh, we, we would have the engineer there with the plans and, and, and sit down we're and show that. them what we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. We'd, ha we'd be happy to have a neighborhood meeting, frankly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if we can maybe get some contacts that yeah it would be nice out. if there was one we point of contact for yeah, Brentwood yeah. and one we, point of contact for they have that if we're noticing the um the um communication that we receive from each um neighborhood so I reached we out to one okay well we'll get to the right people I I feel confident about that my, my cell phone number for anyone has a pen and paper 781. Wow. God bless him. Wow. <laughs> I've been doing this for over 25 years and I'm successful. Write this and down, everyone. 781 389 3100. He wants to address your concerns. I, I want to address the concerns and I want to set this meeting up. And Wonderful. It's, it's a give and take. Well, you appreciate laughing that. <laughs> we think that's great. It's great. That's, that, we couldn't ask you for that's more than bad. that. I, I, I've tried to have an attorney, it just didn't work out, and so I'm here. And, <laughs> and I said earlier in the, in the meeting, I would give my number out during construction. We figured it's going to be 12 months, so when that's a problem, take the we phone We appreciate out. that. Yeah. That's great. Okay, I think in the interest of everyone's time, I am going to request that we um, make a motion to continue, please. The next meeting is November 28th. Okay, so I move to continue this hearing to November 28th at 6.30 p.m. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna take a brief five minute recess. We have um, a lot more work uh, ahead of us. Um, Appreciate everyone uh, attending. Do we have to vote that? Just vote on the recess yeah. just to cover your okay. uh, I move to make a five minute recess five minute. to eight, yeah. 18. Great. Say second. Aye. Yes, favor. Aye. 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 Run to the bathroom.
we are yeah, we we're, good. We're back on 818. I think we need to ask them to be, or move down the hallway. Yeah. Thanks, Mary Beth. Oh. Madam Chair. Last men standing here. <laughs> I don't know. Football. All right. So good evening. Um, we are going to continue on, and this is a continued hearing from our September 26, uh, 2020 meeting. This is uh, in reference to 409 South Street, Graystar Development, LLC, and its comprehensive permit. Um, 40B to permit the construction of a 196 unit age restricted apartment community. Um, I would, before we continue on, ask Mr. Armenti please to attest to the fact that he has abided by the law, um, the Mullins law, that he has reviewed the former footage of our past meetings and you're prepared to sign that you did that. Yes, Thank I you. did. Wonderful. Okay. Good evening again, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Ask you to introduce yourself and continue on with our oh hearing. That really worked well. <laughs> <laughs> now there's an echo, which is nice. <laughs> Ambience. Uh, I am James Haley. I work for Graystar. Um, I'm an associate on the development team. Um, I'm Gary Kerr with Graystar. I head up um, all development in the Northeast. Um, I sit in Boston. Unfortunately, Chris Lagaki, who you've met here sometimes before, he and his wife had a baby on Friday, and he's oh, out for a few muzzle. weeks. So Wonderful. you will see him in the future. He's still around. Great. And uh, we're. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> it's fortunate for him, unfortunately, for the, for the committee. Today. Fortunately, but they have. He will, he will be back and um, sends his best regards. And this is we uh, Rebecca. send ours as well. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Hi, uh, Rebecca Brown from Greenman Peterson, and we're the traffic consultants for this project. Wonderful. Thank you very much. All right. So where have we left off? Do we have? Sorry, I know I stepped out. Do you have the model? Oh yes. Sorry. Do we have the mind that first. Yes. So announcing that we have. Did we do that already? The Mullins. The letter. Yes, we did. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. We did. We did. That's okay. We it just needs to be acknowledged. We need acknowledgement, please. So if you don't mind, I know you sent me a signed version. Would you just mind coming up and signing it? Absolutely. Um, yourself. Yeah, uh, Gary, you're the authorizing. Oh. <laughs> And while we're doing that, I'm going to continue on. It does on. have Chris's name, so if you don't mind, just fine. Okay. Didn't realize he wasn't going to be here. And then, what else? I'm sorry. I'm going to continue on. Sure I've got okay. it. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you. So during this hearing, the board will be focusing on the review of the traffic report for the proposed project. The applicant's traffic consultant will be invited to present their study on the traffic impacts and the mitigation of the project. And the board's peer review, McMahon and Associates, will then present their review. Jeff Howland, uh, director of DPW, uh, will also add his comments. Oh, I'm sorry. It looked right over you. I apologize. <laughs> His head was down. He was hiding. <laughs> he was hiding. Um, and also our consultant um, from MHP, Paul Haverty, is also in attendance. Thank you for that. Ms. McAllister, are there any brief updates that you can provide to us? Yes. So aside from all the work that's been done to prepare for this hearing, I just wanted to give the board a quick background of what's going on as well. So we've got um, we're working with the applicant to revise the waivers regarding water and sewer. Um, so that's an ongoing conversation. We're also in conversation with the assessors to get a um, new address for the parcel um, as 409 will remain at with the uh, residential home. So that's forthcoming. And then the, um, I have sent out arch architecture peer review requests um, for, uh, again, an architectural peer review. And waiting back, when, waiting to hear back from the geotech um, peer review for the slopes um, for their for yeah for their review of, of the plans. So a lot of different moving pieces. Um, we'll be sending that to you as we get them, notifying you as changes come up for those. So um, I think that is it at the moment. Any board members have any comments, questions on any of the information so far? 
-hmm. Has the site plan changed at all since we last met? And thank you, yes. So I believe the applicant is gonna touch on that. Okay. They did submit um, a revised plan, correct? correct? I believe you did. Um, so it, it should be in your folders. Um, obviously that was today, so I understand yeah. that the board hasn't had a chance to take okay. a look. So we will likely be speaking about those changes as well as any uh, revisions or responses to the uh, Graves Common Letter at the next meeting. Okay, thanks. So it's strictly traffic today. Yes, with, with maybe a, I, I believe they wanted to do an overview okay. of those changes if the board is uh, amenable. Alrighty. Okay, without further ado, I invite you to begin your presentation. Right. Great. Rebecca? All right, thank you. Uh, so we did put together a traffic impact and access study for this project. Um, prior to putting this together, uh, we did meet for a scoping session with the planning department um, to scope out what would be included in the traffic study, including uh, the time periods for analysis, uh, the intersections that would be studied, um, when we would actually collect the traffic counts that would be included, and what projects we should be including in terms of uh, background development that for projects that would be um, constructed ahead of this project or are ahead in the permitting process. Um, so up on the TVs right now is showing the study area that was included um, as part of the traffic study. So you can see here, um, the site is located here at the corner of Route 20 and South Street. And we included the intersections of Route 20 with South Street, uh, the northerly portion of it that intersects with Green Street, as well as the southerly portion of South Street over here, um, and the intersection of Chestnut and South Street and the intersection of Route 9 at South Street as well. Um, the time periods where traffic counts were collected and uh, traffic was analyzed were the weekday morning peak hour and weekday evening peak hour, um, as these would represent the peak hours of traffic both for um, adjacent street and for site-generated trips with this being a residential uh, development. So traffic counts were collected uh, back in April of 2022. Um, they were adjusted for seasonal variation um, consistent with Mass DOT standards, and that was verified by the town's peer review consultant as well. Um, <coughs> and because we started this traffic study before Mass DOT issued their directive that no longer requires COVID-19 adjustments, we had also applied a COVID-19 adjustment to the traffic volumes of 3.5%. Um, they have since... Um, said that any counts collected after March 31st of this year no longer require COVID adjustments. So since we counted in April, um, we did not need to do that. So our volumes are uh, conservative based on that being included. Um, and that was noted in the peer review as well, that that was a uh, conservative traffic volumes. Uh, we've grown the traffic volumes out to a seven year design horizon to 2029 based on a 0.5% per year growth rate. Um, which was consistent with other traffic studies that have been prepared uh, for other developments in the surrounding area and um, is actually conservative when considering traffic volumes in the area have actually been decreasing slightly over the last 10 years. Uh, we also added in traffic from a number of other developments, including the, um, the Poinette Hills Farm, the Charles River Labs that were only partially occupied at the times that the counts were done, the University of Massachusetts, again, that was only partially occupied, um, so we did assume full occupancy of that. Um, the Edgemere Crossing at Flint Pond, the Village at Grafton Woods, and the Centec Park North development right across the street. Um, we also considered other um, planned roadway improvement projects going on in the area. Uh, we know that Route tw uh, um, Mass DOT has a Route 20 master plan project. Um, although the funding and timeline for the construction of those improvements has not yet been identified. So we did not include it in our no build and build analysis, but we did also include a sensitivity analysis that showed the impacts of the um, Route 20 intersections once that project um, is actually implemented so that you would be able to see what that would look like as well. Um, then we estimated trips for the site um, based on ITE trip generation uh, rates for a um, senior adult housing development, um, with this being a 55 and over community. 
and projected those trips onto the adjacent roadway network uh, based on a journey to work model for um, where people who live within the town of Shrewsbury are working um, and their anticipated routes to get there. Um, one of the comments that came from the peer review consultant was whether um, this type of distribution made sense given that this is a 55 and over community. Um, but being a 55 and over community, there is obviously a large population that is still working. Um, and those are the majority of the people who are traveling during those weekday morning and evening commuter time periods. So we do feel that that distribution makes sense. Um, in addition, a lot of the employment centers in the surrounding area are also um, areas with a lot of commercial development where people who are headed to shopping um, and other commercial developments would also want to travel. So um, we don't think there's a different distribution pattern that needs to be made. Um, based on that. So you can see here um, kind of how the distribution flows out over each of the study area roadways. We do anticipate that the project would generate an increase of roughly uh, 40 vehicle trips during either the weekday morning or evening peak hour, obviously with the majority of those being exiting in the morning and entering during the evening peak hour. Uh, so we projected those out over to the study area intersections and then ran a capacity and queue analysis looking at uh, the operations of each of the study area intersections. And this diagram here is showing you uh, the level of service on the worst approach on any of the intersections. It, um, it is, represents the color of the circle and the number inside the circle represents the increase in delay that would occur. Um, the highest increase in delay on any movement through the intersections. So you can see that the intersection of Route 9 and South Street has the highest increase in delay of, of nine seconds per vehicle on any one approach. Um, overall, the intersection increases by about two seconds of delay per vehicle uh, passing through the intersection. And the reason for that really is that intersection is already reaching capacity, so a little bit more traffic <coughs> ends up with a lot more delay to it. Um, but it is relatively low with a nine second vehicle, or nine seconds per vehicle increase. Um, all the other intersections you can see are operating well um, at levels of service C or better. Um, the intersection here at South Street and Route 9 is shown as operating at a level of service F. Um, that is mainly because at the time that we did the traffic <coughs> count, left turns were um, actually allowed coming out of there and since then uh, the left turns have been restricted. Hmm. Um, so it is now signed and striped as a right turn out only movement. So we've analyzed this as a left turn, um, which is what's creating a lot of the delay. <coughs> so with that being analyzed as a right turn only, we would anticipate that that level of service will um, improve significantly with all the vehicles taking a right turn out. Um, and we likely won't see much increase in delay at that intersection at all. Uh, so we also did review the crash history at the study area intersections. Um, and all of the intersections within the study area <coughs> had crash rates that were um, below the statewide and district-wide averages uh, for similar types of intersections, with the exception of the um, Route 9 and South Street intersection, where um, that intersection recently had a road safety audit that was conducted and some improvements that were done since then that we would anticipate to reduce um, the collision occurrence compared to what is shown here, um, which was from 2015 to 2019. Um, so pre-COVID conditions and pre those improvements being implemented at that intersection. Um, so we do anticipate that that one will go down. And this project is, um, as we've shown, isn't likely to have a significant impact at that intersection. The only other one that was kind of a, getting close to um, the statewide average was the Route 9 and South Street intersection. And um, with that having a lot of rear end and angle collisions created by those left turns coming out. So with that being changed to a right turn out only, um, that likely will decrease the, the collision occurrence at that location as well. Uh, we also did a review of the site distances at the site driveway intersection with Chestnut Street as well as the South Street intersection with Chestnut Street. So the ones on top are showing you what the sight lines in each direction um, where the proposed site driveway will come out at Chestnut Street. And you can see from this diagram, you can see quite far in either direction. And with 
the clearing of the brush um, along the site frontage, um, you'll be able to see um, well over the, the um, required sight lines based on Ashto coming out of the site driveway. Um, the big item that we noticed though was at the Chestnut Street and South Street intersection where if you are coming out of the, um, if you're coming down the hill on Chestnut Street and there's kind of that awkward triangle yep. um, and if you go to the left of that triangle and you're looking left, um, the embankment that you see right here uh, does block your sight line. Um, and as part of the site plans which were just recently submitted to the town, um, this area will be regraded to improve that sight line um, to meet not just the minimum requirement for Ashto, but the desirable requirement um, for Ashto for sight lines. Um, and there will be a retaining wall that will be placed well back beyond that sight line triangle. Uh, so we will be providing you with updated sight line triangles as part of our response to comments that will show that that area will remain clear that the wall will be back beyond um, the requirement. Um, but with that, the sight lines at uh, both those two intersections will exceed the Ashto um, desirable sight lines. Um, so with that, um, as I mentioned, sight lines will exceed Ashto. Um, the crash rates at the study area intersections are at or below average with the exception of the one location where the road safety audit was done and improvements were completed. Um, the traffic volumes for this study were um, projected using very conservative assumptions. And um, based on those, it adds only one vehicle every five to 10 minutes on any of the study area <coughs> intersections and results in very minimal uh, changes in delay or queues at any of the study area intersections. Um, we did have just a couple of items that we wanted to um, throw out in response to some of the comments in the peer review letter. I don't know whether you want to hear the peer reviewer first or um, us to respond to those I think items. Like I know a couple of them I mentioned as we went along through the presentation. Yeah, let's let the peer reviewer have his moment. <laughs> <laughs> He's waited all night. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, further ado. Again, for the record, uh, Jeff Bianditi, project manager with <coughs> Man Associates. So we did the peer review for um, the noted project. Um, uh, we've submitted a response to comments letter back on October 17th, and the town um, in McMahon has got together and discussed some of the comments um, related to what was included in the original study. And I just wanted to hit on um, some of the high notes that I know that Ms. Brown had, had touched on a few of them already. Um, so I just wanted to outline what those were so that the applicant could provide the responses noted. Um, when uh, talking mostly about the scoping, um, you know, we understand the, the extent of the study area that was included. Um, and, and I don't know if it's helpful to flip back to that first, um, that first, the, first uh, the study area map that you had up first, uh, just to illustrate some of the, the uh, inclusion of some of those intersections. So I just wanted to note that the, um, the intersection with Chestnut Street at Route 9 um, was not originally included in the scope. Um, understandable from looking at the study here that it's not a signalized location like some of the others or may not see necessarily the amount of existing traffic that some of the other locations might uh, but given the proposed location of the site driveway on Chestnut Street and you know as the applicant illustrated the uh, high crash rate at the intersection of Route 9 and South Street and also the uh, potential increase in delay at that intersection we felt that given um, the use and, and desire line of folks exiting the site, it might make sense, especially for those that are traveling east on Route 9, that it might be the likely and most desirable route to turn right out of the site onto Chestnut Street and then turn right onto, um, onto Route 9 rather than turn left out of the site, right onto South Street and then encounter perhaps some additional delay or queuing at the Route 9 at South Street intersection. So as part of our scope of services, we performed a site visit to uh, investigate the viability of, of potentially having additional trips on Chestnut Street. Mm -hmm. So we found it was generally viable, again, um, with the exclusion of, of Chestnut Street from the study area. We don't know to what extent that roadway would be able to handle extra traffic. Uh, I know the traffic study did mention some friction factors that may be um, encountered. Uh, we understand there's a lot of you know, activity along Chestnut Street to some extent, you know, site driveways and things like that. But if folks are going to be using 
that intersection of Chestnut at South at uh, Route Nine. We would just like that intersection to be looked at. Is, is are the sight lines okay there? Is it viable for uh, additional traffic? Um, the study mentions, um, you know, 636 trips per day. Um, doing the the math with the distribution, understandable that not all of those trips are going to come out and turn right, but at least a, a portion of them might be. So whatever that ends up being, we just want to make sure that the viability of that as an alternative for egress from the site um, makes sense from both, uh, you know, from a capacity perspective, not as much because it's only just a right turn once you get to Route 9, but mostly from a safety perspective. You know, is there any demonstrated uh, history of crashes there? Is there anything that could be done with respect to sight lines, additional signage, things like that that could potentially um, increase the viability of that as an alternative access from the site? Um, the second thing I wanted to touch on was um, the geometry at, at Chestnut and South Street, and I know that was mentioned um, as far as the geometry with the, the triangle. Um, you know, we talked about how the sight lines would be cut back based on the existing embankment. Um, you know, given the, the, the entrance from the site from South Street turning left, um, based on our site visit, it, it looks to me that it, it's kind of an awkward entry. Um, drivers aren't really sure which side of the island they should be staying on when they're t making that left turn. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was just looking for some potential alternatives to modifying the geometry at that intersection. Um, you know, potential alternatives could be closing that west leg entirely and making it a T intersection, or potentially adding some level of additional signage or something like that that could potentially just, you know, we understand there's, there's not a demonstrated uh, crash history there, but, you know, and, and, you know, we always like to look at things that are like near misses. You know, sometimes maybe somebody might turn left and someone happens to not be there like we're in is in some cases that might not actually be the case so we just want the applicant to potentially look at alternatives at that location especially you know given that that's the predominant way of entry to the site um, given that there's no left turns from you know route 9 down chestnut street potentially all of the traffic is coming uh, you know in that direction um, and the third I, I believe was touched on a little bit was the trip distribution patterns um, that certainly makes sense uh, given the senior housing. We understand 55 plus doesn't necessarily mean that nobody's working. Um, but again, related to the distribution patterns, um, if Chestnut Street were to be um, used as a viable alternative, would that kind of, we understand it doesn't affect the, the sort of macro directions, but if there's a sort of, um, you know, diversion of some trips that were to use the Route 9 at South Street intersection that are now using Chestnut Street, what would that look like? You know, potentially there would be some improvement in what the level of service at Route 9 at South Street would be. So that could be something that the applicant could look into as a, as a positive overall. Um, and another was just the, uh, the comparison with the Saturday analysis. I know that the applicant participated in a scoping session that included the weekday morning and weekday afternoon. Uh, table five in the traffic study showed that the, the Saturday midday peak hour is actually higher than both the weekday AM and PM. Um, that's not to say that Saturday is the highest when you look at how the adjacent roadway network compares to the weekday afternoon, um, for instance. So we don't necessarily expect a full workup and analysis of all the intersections during a Saturday, but just some sort of comparison between how the adjacent roadways look on a Saturday versus the PM, and then some sort of sensitivity analysis and, and how that compares to what was put together um, during the weekday morning in weekday afternoon. Um, and did you want me to go over a couple of the discussion points that we had subsequent to us just submitting the letter, or is that something that the town would wanna, would wanna outline themselves? No, yeah. I'm fine. Okay. So subsequent to us putting together our letter, and we could certainly have the dialogue as needed, uh, you referenced <coughs> the Route 20 at South Street um, intersection in terms of the, the Mass DOT project. Um, we understand as part of that project there'll be some sidewalk construction and, and crosswalk construction at that location in addition to some additional lanes. Um, given the proximity of the site, as you can see on, on the board here, and I understand the access is not direct from the site onto South Street or Route 20, but given the, the viability of, and walkability of you know, Route 20 subsequent to the construction of, of Mass DOT improvements, 
it's possible that folks that are living in this facility, especially being in the active adult community, it's possible that they may want some sort of direct connection from the site to the new, the new connection at Route 20 at South Street. Um, and you know, uh, from the site plan, there is a crosswalk shown at the site driveway with pedestrian ramps located on either side. However, that pedestrian connection doesn't continue to South Street, nor does it continue from South Street, from Chestnut Street to Route 20. Um, and I understand the applicant is putting together some additional plans that might show uh, sight lines related to, um, you know, the proximity to the retaining wall. And I was just curious if the if the applicant had any had any plans to potentially put in a sidewalk from Chestnut Street, um, from the site driveway down Chestnut Street, and then to South Street to Route 20 to provide that sort of direct connection as well. Um, and the and the last portion was. Um, the potential with additional crashes uh, just west of the uh, Chestnut Street, South Street um, intersection that was not included in the analysis. Um, we certainly understand there are limitations to um, doing uh, crash data research. Um, you know, when you, you pick an intersection point, it only gives you a certain radius beyond that intersection. So when the applicant put together the original study, it's, <clears throat> excuse me, understandable that crashes just west of that site driveway where there's a, a slight horizontal curve that kind of comes around. It's, it's, it's more so for vehicles traveling southbound towards the site as, as the roadway is, is a little bit wide and then it kind of narrows as the sidewalk kind of disappears and you go around the bend. So we were able to provide some additional context and found that there were a few crashes that occurred just west of that um, Chestnut Street at South Street uh, driveway um, in the last four years, which wouldn't have been represented in the Mass DOT crash data because, again, this data is so recent that Mass DOT has not, quote unquote, closed that data. In other words, it's still open and can be adjusted as needed as, as the reporting kind of filters through its process. But I just wanted to make the town and the applicant aware that we were able to research some additional crashes that may not have been attributed to that location specifically but are present um, along South Street. So it speaks a little bit to the geometry um, of vehicles, additional vehicles that might be approaching and accessing um, the site from South Street southbound coming from Route 9. So I'll, I'll pause there for any additional questions or clarifications that you may have at this time. Questions, comments from the board? I have some. Do you have any? No, it's good. Oh, okay. Um, so thank you both <laughs> for uh, your reports. Um, my biggest concern was the Chestnut and South Street sight lines. So I'm really happy to hear that the site plan's been modified. I haven't looked at it yet, though. Um, and on both sides, you both <laughs> addressed that. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. I, I also had questions about the South Street and Route 20 plans. Um, and I wondered, I, I, I remember it including sidewalks and, and whatnot, but I couldn't remember, couldn't recall how far back it goes um, toward Chestnut Street. So I really appreciate your comments on perhaps looking into extending sidewalks. I don't believe the first site plan, site plan really included any sidewalks. So um, looking forward to maybe seeing that in the revised site plan going forward. Um, I had a question for the town. Has our UMass, has the UMass abutter been in communication with us at all? And have they been in contact with you, the appellant, at all? Do we have any communication whatsoever? I'm not aware of okay. any direct communication with myself. Okay, because I too drove through there and went the opposite way on Chestnut Street, <laughs> thinking that's what I would do. Um, so I, I hope we hear from them and hear what they have to say um, about that possibility. So I appreciate your uh, asking to have the Route 9 Chestnut Street also included in the traffic analysis. I think that's very important. Can I just say, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, I also appreciate that because if you put basically any point east from that location into a like a GPS like Google Maps or something like that it has you go up Chestnut Street to Route 9 
Um, so it, it will be helpful to see that, or it is helpful that you raise that. Yeah. Thank you. That's all. Sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. Um, and then the last point, I, I too was particularly interested in the crash report and the bend <laughs> that is on South Street. So thank you for bringing that up as well. And this has, I wouldn't expect the appellant to do this, but I'm, and I don't know if the residents there would appreciate this, but extending the guardrails around that corner, um, I don't think you would want that, however, because oh, it's oh, kind of ugly. Uh, sorry, okay, great. But if we could do something, um, we post the speed limit there. It is. It says 30, but I wonder if it should be even less. I see the arrows. I slow down all the time. I use that road all the time. But um, there have been four crashes, I believe, and or I, I don't know how many. We'll, we'll see when we see the revised or the response. So that's it. Sorry, I had a lot of comments there, but thank you. Okay. Anybody else? I agree with what Lisa said. I'm concerned about the traffic. Um, in interested in seeing if any of the peer review suggestions can be implemented. Um, yeah. Great. Mr. Howland. Uh, Jeff Howland, DPW Director. For clarification, Mass DOT has an earmark now for the design and construction of the Route 20 corridor from South Street, South Street, Green Street intersection to the North Borough Line. It was announced about a month ago. Great, do you know what, when that's earmarked? Uh, so they are currently in the 25% design phase. Uh, they hope to have 25% design done by spring, which I think for Mass DOT is kind of quick. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's what they're saying, and they want to move uh, expeditiously towards uh, construction within the next couple of years. At least that's their goal. And I believe there is a sidewalk on the north side and a share use path on the south side. Mm. Thank you for that. Attorney Haverty, do you have anything to add? Any comments? We're no. good? Okay. All right. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, it's a public meeting, so is there anyone that wishes to be heard on this matter? Our two friends in the back. <laughs> David Sanger, 400 South Street. The last thing I wanted to delay was like Patriots and Celtics action tonight. <laughs> Here we are. Uh, a couple of quick notes. I don't know if I heard this correctly, but did the traffic studies say that in the last 10 years traffic decreased in the area? Because that, that just wouldn't seem to make sense to me, so I'd like to have some clarification on that. Um, as far as the increase in delay at the traffic light at South Street and Route 20, the two second per vehicle just doesn't seem realistic. Anybody that sat behind an 18 wheeler who's the first vehicle to turn right after a red light, you're lucky to get one truck through there before it changes again. With the proposed development that's ever nearing, that's going up next to me on the Allen Farm property, it's going to be a, a large increase or potential increase of truck traffic that probably wasn't. Um, included in here, and when you back two 18-wheelers up on that South Street Route 20 intersection, you're going to have a, a, a major problem as far as time delays and things like that, so I don't see that happening. Some stuff has been touched on here as far as where the accident occurs. This board well knows. Uh, Mr. Howland's been active, and we've been active in uh, the cars that wind up in my driveway and in my property um, from these crashes. <laughs> I was very uh, excited a couple of weeks ago and after 30 years, I saw a 30 mile per hour speed limit yeah. sign come up on the telephone pole with a, a flashing radar to try and get people to slow down. I don't know if it worked because when I put the new uh, mailbox in to replace the old one, <laughs> it didn't really seem, seem like they slowed down much. Cars come over that yellow line consistently. There's a huge, um, just a huge, uh, still potential dangerous impact to that. If you've noticed recently, which I did, and I emailed with Mr. Howland on Thursday, that 30 mile an hour speed limit sign and the flashing radar sign came down just as fast. It went up. Why? Because it's the same problem we've had for 30 years. We can't post a speed limit on that road without the traffic surveys, without the average speed. 30 miles an hour. Again, I was elated to see that it was up there, but I kind of had a feeling it was 
not really the right speed. So that was taken down. The average speed, I was told, based on that traffic survey was about 36 or 38 miles per hour, which took, and I'm not sure if that included traffic only coming at the radar or traffic also uh, going away from the radar, but what impacted that radar study was <laughs> I've got a disastrous amount of dump trucks and big rigs and, and, and loading vehicles coming out of the construction site on South Street for the, the Centec project. They come out of that driveway at five, 10 miles an hour, some roll down. So there's a great, uh, there was a great impact on that traffic study. I guarantee you the average uh, rate of speed goes higher than that, which creates a problem because to create a speed limit, mm -hmm. you need to create an average speed. Mm -hmm. So the average speed based on the radar taken just a couple of weeks ago would have been bumped up to 40. In real time, when you take all the truck traffic that's now on the road, and also then if you start to add Bach Toyota, if you start to add this, there's, a, there's such a fluctuation of, of, of traffic and uh, where they're coming and how fast they're going. It seems ludicrous to me that the state can put in bylaws that can override a town's uh, bylaws through Chapter 40B because we don't have enough uh, uh, low-income housing. Yet on the reverse, we can't come up with a bylaw and say to the state, I understand the premise of MADDOT, we have to take a traffic survey, we need to take an average speed, and that's where it's determined. How does that rule over safety on the street? And so I plead with this board to find a ways to find bylaws that we can reduce the speed. As I said to Mr. Howe and, and, and also uh, uh, copied um, uh, Ms. McAllister, what really needs to be done, and look, I'm in, I'm, I'm in favor of this, this project. Based on everything that's coming around, I think it's great for the town. We talked about low income and how it can bring that up. The impact to the area compared to everything. I like it. I want to see this, this get done. But I know where those dangers come from, and it's on that road. And I asked Mr. Howland, rather than just a curved arrow, how about we come up with some verbiage on the road that says, sharp turn ahead, a, a sign that actually says, slow down now, a sign that actually says, stay on the left side, of, or stay on this side of the yellow line. And signs like that, I'm a traveling salesman. Those have much more impact than 30 miles an hour or 40 miles an hour, or if a future road study would be done, 50 miles an hour based on mass dots uh, requirements how to establish a speed limit. So it's really, we're such at the beginning phases of this and I, and I still get that, but before we really start talking about sidewalks and, 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 and additional um, traffic and additional pedestrian traffic, we still need to address the number one concern which is the speed on the road, the safety on the road, and if you go back to you know, the sight lines from Chestnut Street, yeah, they're okay. The best way to understand how that traffic works and how fast it can come up from Route 20 or come down from Route 9, come in my driveway and try and back out, <laughs> okay? To get out of my driveway, I need to took, I back out, I look left to 20, I look right to Route 9, I look left to 20, I look right to Route 9, and a third time to Route 20 to be sure that I'm safe because you have no idea how fast those cars approach. My driveway a little bit west from Chestnut Street. Coming up from Route 20, it's even faster. The Fredericks couldn't make it here tonight. They're the first driveway over. So I think, again, there's a lot of things that I'm in favor of this. That's a great, you know, for the, for, for the area, but there's a lot of safety issues, you know, that still need to get done. And based on Mr. Howland's um, email reply, they're, they're checking into things but at this point, there's really no solution. And the only solution, other than verbiage signage, is to create that speed limit, which will be worse than what we're looking at now. So uh, that's uh, kind of where I, where, uh, where I wanted to be tonight. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello. Hi. I'm Nancy. I own Donnie Jean's Pet Resort right there next to where you're going to build. A couple things. Um, the car carriers, I keep bringing this up. They will come down Chestnut Street from Hyundai, BMW. They don't care if you're in the road. They're going 35, 40 miles an hour. So is there a way to make them not do that to get to 20, get on Route 9? Route 9's right there. They drive down, get on 20, go where they want. Don't come flying down Chestnut Street. Because if you have two cars, and they don't do it at midnight. They do it at 7 a.m., 8 a.m. They're right there at your peak times. And you're saying they're going to come out of your driveway and take a left. If there's cars backed up here, you're going to have a backup in your driveway. 
So then you might have somebody trying to inch out. Somebody's going to come from South Street onto Chestnut, boom, and hit you. It's such a blind spot right there that really needs to be re-addressed. And I don't know if you've ever stood after you've had a good rain or snow melt. That road is an ice rink. It is just that left side, the right side going down. It is just massive water. Goes to the bottom of that hill, pools there. You can't stop. So there's a couple of concerns with that. The other thing is that at the peak time that you're talking about, a lot of people use Chestnut Street who work on Route 9 eastbound. So they come up 20, come off south, come down, come up, go down Chestnut, turn because they work in those businesses there. So there is a lot of activity at that time going straight down Chestnut, then going east onto Route 9. So it is a lot busier than I think is being made up to be. Um, and that's a concern for my business because daycare starts <laughs> at 6, 6.30, 7, 8. So that's my peak time. And you add all this on top of it, it is going to get a little congested and a little bit more dangerous. That's all. Thank you. David Singer, 400 South Street. One last comment I've got on, on the guardrail issue. Probably 20 years ago, we were, we were offered to have that happen. I don't think anybody here really wants to have guardrails in front of them. So years ago, we've had accidents forever. The recent ones we all know about, I left my file at home from the last 30 years, so this is not a new occurrence. It happens all the time, about maybe 10 or 12 years ago with one of the insurance settlements we had because we had one of the retaining walls uh, knocked out. Before we could fix it, another car came over the same retaining wall. So we took the second settlement and bought all the boulders, if everybody, if people are familiar with my property, mm -hmm. and put them out there. If you drive by now, all those boulders are like pebbles because they've all been hit. They've all been broken. If you drive by my property, you see a bunch of the boulders that are in my property. So that's kind of our remedy. In fact, just, just yesterday and then today, um, we met with people. We're going to... We're going to remedy that. We're, we're getting new boulders. We're going to you know, spend our own money and put some bigger boulders and at least kind of protect the property and keep people a little bit safer. Um, extending a guardrail is definitely not an option for us at, at 400 South Street. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? <coughs> Comments? Questions? Would we like to continue? Madam Chair, could we respond to yes. a few of the, the comments that came up? Sure can. From the peer review, the board, sure. and, and from the um, residents as well. Um, just on a few of the <coughs> items from the, the peer review, um, so we, we did look into a number of the things already that were uh, mentioned by Mr. Bandini um, in terms of the, um, the Route 9 and Chestnut Street intersection being evaluated. Um, I'm just going to jump ahead. So. On this one, you can see about 20% of the traffic that would be generated by the project would be headed out towards Route 9 to the east. Um, and really, that would be exiting traffic because uh, there's a median down the middle of the road, so nobody who is coming from that direction would be able to take a left turn in. People who are coming down uh, from Route 9 from the west we do anticipate that with the ease of taking that right-hand turn at the signal, they're probably going to do that there as opposed <coughs> to going, you know, continuing straight through the signal and coming down Chestnut Street. So the only people who would really go through that intersection would be leaving the site and going out Route 9 to the east, um, which when you look at the volume of traffic that we're anticipating to generate in this percentage, it results in about four to five vehicle trips um, during either the morning or evening peak hour. Yeah. Um, which really is not going to have much of an impact on traffic operations at this intersection. Um, so rather than taking the time to go out and do additional counts and mm -hmm. analysis that's really going to show us a couple of seconds increase, what we would prefer to do is take a look at, um, as was mentioned, the sight lines, the, the safety of that intersection, and really focus on that instead so that Anything we're, we're doing there, the money is being spent to mitigate a safety issue rather than do an analysis that's not going to show us much from a traffic operations perspective um, if the board would be amenable to us taking that approach. Um, the other thing that came up was the uh, Saturday analysis that was requested. And Mr. Bandini did say that he wasn't necessarily asking for us to go out, do counts, do a whole operations analysis, but 
to do kind of a qualitative assessment of whether there would be any additional impact. So on a Saturday, as was mentioned, um, it is the higher of the time periods for trip generation um, by about 12 vehicle trips. When you distribute that out through the study area intersections, it ends up being about three vehicle trips on any of the roadways uh, leading in and out of the study area. Um, by comparison, the traffic volumes on a Saturday are uh, two to 350 uh, vehicles lower in the Saturday midday time period than they are in the weekday PM time period. So that was why the Saturday condition wasn't included when we went through the scoping process. So um, for that reason, we would um, not include the, the Saturday analysis with the PM being the, the more critical time period. Um, the sidewalks um, going down to South Street at Route 20, I know um, it sounds like DOT may be advancing that project a little bit sooner than we had originally anticipated. Um, initially, our concern was if we are in and constructed way before them, then we're constructing sidewalks mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. nowhere and encouraging people to walk down to the, you know, not the safest <laughs> location to send pedestrians down to. So we can take another look at that now that the situation has changed a little bit. Um, and then for uh, crashes just west of um, Chestnut Street, along South Street, along this bend, um, and the discussion about changing this intersection here, um, we have kind of taken a brief look at that since we got the comment letter in. And it does look like there's some um, relatively low impact things that could be done there to make it a large impact on the safety of that curve and of this intersection with some additional signage, uh, some striping changes that would better indicate where drivers are actually supposed to be going. Um, to Mr. Singer's point about speeds on the roadway, this is something that we face all the time where we get requests from towns to change the speed limit and they want us to go out and do a speed study. We do the speed study, it turns out the speeds are higher and then mass dot wants to come and change the speed limit higher what we do in those um, insta instances is we recommend traffic calming measures to first lower the speed of vehicles going around that curve mm -hmm. then redo the speed study and petition mass dot for a lower speed limit so that is what we would recommend doing here is um, some measures to try and get the speeds down that would be some additional signage that you know the those little arrows that are out there on the utility poles right now are not MUTCD compliant in terms of spacing and how they're posted. So hmm. getting something out there that is putting those curve um, warning signs out there, things like that that might help to slow people down, recheck the speeds, then petition DOT for a lower speed limit on that roadway um, would sense. be a, a better approach to, to follow. Um, I think that might be all of the items. Um, if I could just comment to that real quick. Uh, David Singapore on the South Street, and I'd send this to Mr. Howland as well. In order for that to happen, this signage needs to start far, farther towards the Route 9 sign, more towards the Charles River Labs driveways where you see the first crosswalk sign. Again, as I drive, the mentality of people driving, if you don't have signage earlier to get them to start thinking to slow down earlier, it's going to be too late by the time they get to the curve. That was part of the problem with the 30 mile an hour where they put that. Signage needs to start early, get people to start early, aware them of the dangers, and they'll slow down. Thank you. Great. Make more comments? I just have to interject this one. One of the most effective signs I've seen lately is one that it's like the speed limit signs. It's monitoring your speed, but it says, slow down, please. And then it, it senses that you slow down, and it says, thank you. And then you think, oh, my God, <laughs> like somebody's <laughs> watching me. It's the most effective thing I've seen yet. <laughs> OK, there you go. Anyone else? If we could just add, uh, Graystar is prepared to contribute $20,000 to have GPI conduct a traffic calming study, mm -hmm. and the balance that is not used for the study will go into these traffic calming measures that we've talked about and these suggestions. Um, you know, there's a lot of creative ways to, to solve this problem, um, whether it be signage, painted lines, changes in the road texture. So we are all prepared. You know. We, we understand that the, the dangers um, that the residents are raising, and we want to make sure that our residents as well are, you know, day in, day out on a safe path, 
to and from the site. So we are totally aligned and that's something that we are prepared to do. Great, good, very good. Okay. Any other comments from peer review or staff? Any comments, I'm opening up to anybody that, okay, I'm getting a lot of shaking of the head so I'm gonna take that as a, uh, a desire to continue. Yeah. So I move to continue the hearing. Uh, oh. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to make sure I know the applicant had asked potentially to review the revisions to the site plan. Yes. Before we continue. Oh. I just want to address if you still want to do that. I don't know. Yes. I think it would be yeah. helpful for, for us okay. to do that. Please. Sure. So if I could invite Phil Cordero up. Sorry. Do we have this? No, I, yeah, I need to plug in. Yeah. I do. Hi. What are you looking for, Peter? The uh, revised site plan yeah. is we in the folder. Yet. So I think we have it. It is in. So if you go to application, four, what is this, 409 South Street, mm -hmm. right under the comprehensive permit. Is that where you are? You looking at the separate folder? Just give us a second. I'm in the folder for tonight. Is it? Well, the, I have a separate folder for the comprehensive permit. I suggest you look there. I'll just throw it in that one too, though. No, 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 no. Go back. Go back I'll to the year. This one. Revised plans. Stated today, so they must. They've be. also got it up here. I'll put it in your where you're. Yeah. Looking uh, apologies, okay. board. We uh, obviously were submitting information as we went here, and some of this did get to you later than we would have we would have liked. So. Yeah. And so, and so similar to last meeting, where we had a follow-up technical review with. With Graves, um, we propose that you know, after reviewing the plans and in our comments, that you know we, we have another one of those working sessions with the town presence um, to continue into November before the meeting, so we can all you know make sure that we're addressing all the comments and, and all the waivers correctly. So, thank you. Can you steal your laptop for one second? Oh sure. Yeah. Yep. Board, for the record, Phil Cordero from Allen and Major Associates. I'll be very, very brief this evening. We're also acknowledging you've gotten this last minute. We're not expecting anybody to have processed it. If anything, I hope to just point out some highlights and, and focus you on the areas to look at as you go into the materials with your peer review consultant and we meet for the next technical workshop. Uh, the, the first area has already been mentioned which is reconfiguration of some of the grading and the retaining walls down at Chestnut and Salt Street. So that is a, a, a big improvement as recommended by your consultant. We've pulled all of that back to improve the sight lines uh, more than we needed to, of course, to meet sight line demand uh, at the request of your consultant. Um, we've also heard concerns uh, some issues were, ra were raised relative to parking on site. We provided documentation based on uh, Graystar, the applicant's experience in terms of uh, similar projects in terms of what they believe to be a, the appropriate number for parking and would ask you to consider that. Uh, when we get to the site area, we, there was discussion regarding the actual dimensional requirements of the parking spaces to accommodate the potential or what the fire department perceived as potential interference of their circulation around the site, what we've elected to do is rather than deepen the parking spaces, we've made accommodations with deeper sidewalks where bumper overhangs for cars can actually extend over the sidewalk where we have two and a half additional feet that's available without encroaching on pedestrians and encroaching on, on accessibility. So the car can actually, car or truck can actually tuck uh, tightly into the space and avoid that perceived in impact that the fire department had noted during our review sessions. Um, we also heard loud and clear the potential that there are oversized vehicles in this market. Uh, on the southerly portion of our site, uh, we have developed a large parking area. It's 15 parking spaces that are roughly 9 by 22, mm -hmm. so even deeper than the town zoning bylaw standard. And those will be operationally controlled by the developer uh, in, the, in the event that they need those deeper space for vehicles, again, to further reinforce, we don't anticipate, we don't support any encroachment into those drive aisles that are part of the fire lanes um, that Chief Colby had mentioned to us during the introduction. Um, he had also asked us to look uh, more deeply into the accessibility for the fire department around the site. And while the circulation hasn't changed, we wanted to make more accommodations for him 
to be able to access more points of the building, and I'm just flipping to the screen very quickly, I apologize. As part of our swept path analysis plan, <coughs> the Shrewsbury aerial ladder can continue to navigate around the site and reach all points. It is code compliant with NFPA 1. It is code compliant with 527 CMR, the Massachusetts amendments to NFPA 1. What we didn't have on the original plans, which you can see on the screen, is we've, we've added a drive aisle that's traversable by the fire truck to get, us into, to get them into the courtyard area. So it gets them much closer to the inside of that U-shape, which we heard was really necessary to fight emergency conditions for the ladder truck. Um, the other element that we wanted to make sure we uh, provided data and feedback to the board and ultimately to the fire department uh, he had raised concerns about the steepness of two of our areas of the driveway to make sure he could stage on those. He gave us criteria that the truck uh, can't stage beyond eight degrees. So we've given him computations to, to denote that we are in fact less than eight degrees on both of those areas. So that full circumference, that full perimeter of the building is accessible and stageable by the fire department as they choose to, to do it under emerg emergency operations. Um, we have added some additional utility information for, at the request of the DPW for some sewer bypass uh, infrastructure if necessary for this project. So that's been clearly added to the plans. And the latter revisions, all technical in nature at the request of the peer review consultant, detailing of drainage, correction of some, some piping numbers, that's all in there for you uh, and for your consultants to look at. Uh, but by, by being here with you this evening, we wanted to make sure that we were denoting our responsiveness to the applications and making sure these plans are being changed in real time. So every time, is, every time we're in front of you, you're seeing advancement in terms of the, the progress on the project. So that's it for me. Happy to answer any questions if you have them tonight, or we'll deal with them on, on the next meeting. Thanks, Phil. Thank you. So thank you very much, Phil. That was very helpful. Um, you know, as we said, we, we provided some responses on Friday for some of the operational items that we had previously talked about in the past one to two uh, ZBA hearings, uh, one of them being parking. Um, and so we have provided the board data from Graystar's portfolio. Um, Graystar, that we manage uh, 13,500 units of affordable, um, act, or, I'm sorry, excuse me, active adult um, units around the country. The average utilization rate among our parking lots is roughly 0.98. Um, and across our portfolio, we are, for suburban products, very similar to what we are building here, we are about at a 1.2. Uh, our proposed project is at a 1.3. Um, so we think we have a, a really strong buffer um, there that allows for um, residents as well as visitors and employees. Um, would also just like to add that we have uh, reached out to a consultant, Kimley Horn. They are a national consultant. Uh, according to their study, um, they found that roughly the total, the average active adult property in the United States is at a 1.19 um, to satisfy their needs for staff, visitors, and residents. So, you know, again, we we have data. We have our own portfolio data. We have a third-party consultant. Um, we provided Kim Lee Horn's data as well on the last page of the submittal letter that we sent on Friday uh, for you to review. Uh, we've gone through all of the properties listed there. There's 48 of them. Uh, you know, they are all similar in scope in terms of access to public transit. Um, we, we are not cherry picking data from the middle of, uh, you know, looking at a property in the middle of a city where they'd have a low pr parking ratio. and comping us against that. These are all, you know, suburban um, where there is a need for parking and we think that that, that is most similar to um, Album Shrewsbury. Another point that was raised, uh, we also talked about snow removal. Um, so we have identified, uh, you know, lanes within our property to push snow. And we have, you know, across our properties in Massachusetts, throughout the Northeast, throughout the country, protocols in place to deal quickly with snow. First and foremost, dealing with emergency access so that emergency vehicles can get in and out of the property as well as onto the ramp that, that uh, Phil mentioned up to the courtyard. 
Um, and for any snow in, you know, say a, a bad nor'easter, uh, we have the, uh, you know, connections, uh, the uh, relationships with, you know, multiple contractors in this in this region alone to have it removed off site. Any excess snow that is unsafe to keep on site, to remove it from site and put it at a ma approved mass DEP facility um, for removal. A third point is uh, the move-in area. So. On the south side of the plan here, we have designated uh, some spots down here, plan south um, for larger vehicles, because um, we know that they're, you know, we, we acknowledge that vehicles are getting larger um, every year, it seems like. And for move-ins as well, um, this area will be set up for, for maybe a, you know, 10, 15 foot U-Haul that comes in and, and they can use those spaces and because you know we are acting as a property manager, we know when all move-ins are scheduled to happen, we will uh, you know reserve certain spaces for when we know a moving truck is coming. We will first and foremost ensure that it doesn't conflict with trash pickup because again we have the relationship with the trash pickup company. We do not schedule trash pickup at a time when move-ins are scheduled across any of our Graystar buildings. So that is a consideration that you all asked us to look into. And so, you know, we have the protocols in place and we have added these longer parking spots, uh, giving a little bit more buffer on the south side of the, um, of the lot here to allow for both um, increased flexibility for move-ins, uh, snow removal, um, and for, for larger oversized vehicles if, um, if, 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 it, if it is needed. I have a question about sure. that. Um, so are, ha have you increased the number of spaces or you have the same spaces and you just made the ones on the bottom deeper? We have kept the same number, number? of spaces. Okay. We're at a 1.3 okay. spaces per unit. So that has not that changed. changed. Yes, we have, we have, we have provided um, supporting data to show. Yes, okay. yes that so they're for support your argument. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, but the uh, parking spaces on the south side of the lot have been, the size have been increased, the dimensions. Right. And I'm just wondering, uh, you brought them up, you brought up snow storage um, shortly before that. So sure. uh, our building inspector, I believe it was, um, recommended that when you have more additional parking spaces than required, they can sometimes be used for snow storage. But your argument there is, you have an agreement with your snow removal company to take the snow off site if there is no. If there's no place to put the snow, yeah. that is standard protocol. Okay. Yes, to, to have it removed uh, from the site and to open up all the parking. Uh, in, in our in the response letter that we did provide today. Yes, oh, yes I saw. Yeah, which yeah, we, which we'll give you the chance to review and, okay. and we can set up another time to talk about. Phil lays out sort of the the exact sequencing of events okay. that happens with, right. with snow removal and how that sort of works. Um, but okay, happy to have a follow-up discussion on that, talk about right. it next one, one of the unique things I would say about Graystar is we are a totally vertically integrated company. So you're not sitting talking with a developer who then hands this problem off to someone else who it's mm -hmm. not really their responsibility. It all comes around in a circle. We manage close to 800,000 units in the U.S. alone. Mm -hmm. And we have a management company that's the biggest in the U.S. by far. We're very focused on all of these operational details, and it's all it's all being pre-worked out. It's not even something where we need to sit and try and what do we do for this property. This is all you know nice standard operating practice for us now. Yeah. Yeah. We're just used to something else, so yeah. forgive us. Understood. Our yes. expectations are not are different. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being that way. Comments, questions, no concerns. Looking forward to reading the letter. <laughs> we have a lot of reading ahead of us. Okay. Are we good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Might right. I get a motion? Um, I move to continue this hearing to November 28th at 6.30 p.m. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. So moved. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Did the Patriots play that night? <laughs> um, I, I, I will admit to sure. being at the yeah. score. Mm -hmm. oh, 14. Yeah. Hats are winning. What was if it? somebody yeah. was recording that? Um, I, That's okay. I move to adjourn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> move to adjourn. I move to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. 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 Hey, you know what? It comes up on my.